Hello, hello, and welcome to this episode of the King Heroes Journey podcast, where we have the second time uh, presenter, Chance Garten, host of Innerverse podcast, of which I have become a very big fan. Uh, if you're not familiar with Chance, then he is a, uh, he is a deep guy. You know, there's I, I, it's rare I find somebody that can, um, you know, explore things at such a level and often leave me, you know, I was listening to quite a bit of your stuff last night. And there was always these like stop moments like, oh, wow, that was deep. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it's just really fun, because it's tempting right now, especially during these times to, for me, I'll just speak for myself to see it as a little bit of an indulgence, you know, to to explore something other than law and homesteading and how to survive the apocalypse and getting the work out and helping people detox and deprogram and all that kind of thing. Totally apologize for my cord; it's going to be annoying today. And uh, you know, but then but then after spending hours and hours and hours with it, realizing no, this is actually so important to do right now. Right, it's about raising our energy, raising our frequency. You have a tuning fork right in your hand, <laughs> or a toning fork, and I wonder if we can hear it if you put it in your mic. Oh yeah, yeah, I like to warm myself up with this. Can you hear it? It's pretty low frequency. My mic might cut some of that out, but this is yeah. a sonic slider from Eileen A. McCusick's Biofield Tuning Store, BiofieldTuning.com. I'm trying to set up a deal where maybe I can get a little like affiliate commission for selling these because I've been selling the shit out of them. Uh, sorry if I'm not sure to say that word. But I, I really think highly of that device. It helped me heal a long lasting shoulder injury that was dragging on for months and months. So what you said about the indulgence of looking at a topic like games, for example, is actually not so much of an indulgence because it's just yet another way to reach people that might be invested in something without knowing what it is and it connects to the legal world it's all one big gnostic matrix when you think about it and uh we'll be connecting ideas to legal thoughts in this conversation no doubt you'll probably see connections that i don't even have here and in fact this is going to be like a high level overview where any of the examples that we're talking about could have been something that we drilled into and went deep and had an oh that's deep moment but we're going to cover a lot of ground. It's going to be super interesting, I hope. And this for me is exciting because it is the research I'm really passionate about right now. As a host, I don't necessarily bring my research to the show, but I'm a hardcore researcher and have been for years. So this is me. I've done this on other shows before, like uh, Tessarion's show. But this is an updated version of a presentation I came up with maybe a year ago that it keeps evolving as I keep getting more and more information that backs up and supports the theory like i just got wayne's book wayne mccroy cybernetic mm -hmm. messiah mm -hmm. haven't cracked it open yet but i'm positive that this guy's got more pieces of the puzzle to this whole thing so it's a big topic to introduce it's a huge can of worms the seeds of this way of thinking are in everything but it's especially being pushed in to the uh not just the youth. I mean, the main demographic for people that buy video games are actually guys my age and a few years older. So it's a, right. a very wide spectrum situation here. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. I want to say hello to everybody in the chat as well before we dive in. Hello, Cam. You looking forward to it? Hello, uh, uh, Naikas. I always do butcher that one. Yvette is here. Shine bright. Hello, Flattership Bear and Justin. Hello, unrealistic Cliff Burton. <laughs> I love people's <laughs> names. It's so good. Yeah. Robert Page is here. Alicia, welcome. Dot Matrix, looking forward to it as well. Thank you very much for coming down. Zed says he's working on a similar project relating to the inverted Ark of the Covenant from an occult standpoint. So also very interesting. And you see how these things really tie together. I think we probably will have to do a part two. Oh, Malcolm's here. It's awesome. Welcome. 
And, uh, you know, because I was watching last night late and late and late. I'm like, okay, Beth, turn it off. There will be a tomorrow. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I often have that 3 a.m. like, hmm. And uh, so Chance has explored the, the symbols and the archetypes of the tarot with, with uh, incredible detail and, and juxtaposing, showing how it has been severely inverted and, and then, you know, kind of related to the gaming. We won't go deep into that today, but I have a feeling there. We'll might actually be touch two. on that if okay. we uh, get that far. What Perfect. Beth was referring to is a series I did on a game called Cyberpunk 2077. Came out last year. There is so much in that game. It is the most incredibly horrific depiction of the future transhuman hell that I've ever seen. And uh, some people maybe would think that they're, it's being glorified in this game. Other people might think that it's like a warning. I'm not here to pass judgment. I'm just showing you what's out there in the media. And mm -hmm. in that game, they actually created an entire alternate tarot that's a transhumanism version of the tarot. And it is like the most inverted thing I've ever seen in my life, <laughs> or at least in terms of art, is hardcore crazy. And and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> broke mm -hmm. that down with Michael Tessarion on Unslaved and also with Lindsay Sharman from Rogue Ways. Mm -hmm. In both cases, it was a two-parter. Both are kind of worth watching because we come up with different analysis with different researchers, right? And you can just kind of feel the gut punch reaction to seeing these images one after another. And I, I included a couple later in the sl uh, slideshow here, just as an example of that idea of the corrupting of archetypes, which I'm sure you found that concept, that thread that wove through those videos, particularly fascinating considering what you do and who you are. So mm -hmm. uh, those are pretty wild videos. Uh, people, if that sounds interesting, ought to check that out. Mark in the chat mentioned the game had a god awful release. Yeah. Uh, it seemed like there was something important about making that game come out when they put it out, regardless of how finished it was. But that's a, another story. Just that one game could be a couple of shows in itself, how crazy the stuff in it is, including like there's even a part where the player has the option to crucify somebody as a, and like recite lines from the Bible and record it for other people to experience in their brain with like neuron neuron circuitry. So really weird, dark, kind of twisted stuff. But then in other ways, it's like, I'm grateful that I went through that game because it was I was able to see, it asked questions that are important. For example, like never before had a video game ever asked me as the player to comment on whether or not I believed in God. I was never given right. that option in a dialogue before. And I was like, this is, there's something deep going on here with the, with that game synchronistically, or maybe I think that in any of these organizations where perhaps, perhaps producers are pushing certain things into the media, there are still like those renegade artists that are working from imagination. And that's where the synchromysticism comes in. That's where those like subversive messages and warnings and deep webs of symbolism that sort of reveal the agenda to us. Like, uh, you know, the manifestation of the collective unconscious coming to us through our mythology. That's like a really deep Jungian thing. But <laughs> yeah, people in the chat are definitely yeah, uh, resonating with just how crazy that game sounds. And I've barely described a fraction of it, but like mm -hmm. I said, it could be its own conversation. It's mm -hmm. uh, And it will be part of this presentation, a few aspects from it, a few slides. Right. Yeah. I, when I heard you say that yesterday, but that it asks you if you believe in God, like, of course, you know, they're harvesting data and they want to see how much progress they've made. How many atheists are there out there or, you know, people that would be offended by that question or God knows how they got you to answer I don't know it. if that's a data collection metric. I mean, I'm sure they can tell who made what choices in some way, like, because these games are all online, even if it's a single player game. But Mm -hmm. in, a, in the context of a role-playing game, someone might answer that question multiple times in multiple playthroughs and be sort of imagining their character as a different type of character in different playthroughs. And so it doesn't, in my opinion, always reflect what somebody actually believes, how they play out a character in a game. That's mm -hmm. a aspect of this sort of hyper-reality that video games represent. But... To me, it still was profound that the game was asking that question because I was asking that question in the greater context of the extreme transhuman Gnosticism depicted by the game. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, who knows what other people began to think about the concept of God from playing that game that maybe don't think deeply about these things. It's very interesting, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's 
Well, it's becoming more and more in fashion not to believe in God, right? Like that's, to me, the overwhelming uh, sentiment of the the youth out there that it's it's literally in style. I remember I remember I was at a grocery store, just really quick story, and and the woman was being super mean, and she was taking it upon herself to you know be a Karen and and shame me, and she actually threw my change back at me and my receipt, just like tossed it across the counter, and I went, oh yeah. man, I said in the eyes of God you have to be kind, and she's like, I don't believe in God, and and I don't even believe I said that to tell you the truth, it just came out of my mouth. But, uh, you know, it, she was so proud that she was an atheist and had a chance to pull out that card and, and uh, put me in my place. And I'm like, it doesn't, it doesn't actually matter whether you believe in God or not. It has no effect on God. So anyway, let's not get too far off the track here. I know you have uh, 61 slides for us. <laughs> yeah, but I think we can get through them. I have some confidence that it's possible if I uh, trim my assessments down to exactly the flow of this particular conversation, but mm -hmm. I've already done tangents, so we'll see how that goes. I have, <laughs> have faith, though. Yeah, that was fun. Okay, well, uh, I will share your screen for you now, if that works. Absolutely. Okay, we're adding that to stream. Here we go. Cool. I like how StreamYard lets us do it with uh, our face is still on it. Yes. And you got that banner down. That's good. So this mm -hmm. is like just slide one, simulated reality. This image here is of a uh, from a video game called Assassin's Creed. And this is basically like a, a Sophia type character, a digital goddess that lives within a simulation. And that entire game's overarching premise is actually that reality is just l nested layers of simulation. And I, I wanted to start with this image particularly because this is a, a Gnostic character right here, as we'll see when we start to explore what Gnosticism is. Dot Matrix in the chat says the Elder Scrolls series is full of Gnostic ideology also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the Elder Scrolls series, I'll just say, I feel like they just took the existing priest jive and put different names on it and different uh, races to it and made it a fantasy thing. But they basically did the exact same thing that this, this priest hood throughout time has done when they go set up shop in a different area. They just use the same symbolism, same Gnostic stuff and uh, just give the characters different names. So mm -hmm. Assassin's Creed is Luciferian indoctrination. Yeah, <laughs> it could be, could be. Uh, so we'll go into the next slide here. It's a quote from Jean Baudrillard from Simulacra and Simulation. The media represents a world that is more real than reality that we can experience. People lose the ability to distinguish between reality and fantasy they also begin to engage with the fantasy without realizing what it really is. They seek happiness and fulfillment through the simulacra of reality, that is, media, and avoid the contact or interaction with the real world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is the child archetype, by the way. I just wanted to dive in. And uh, the child will be very satisfied by virtual reality because you can be in total denial. You have no idea what's going on in the world. That's a really good point. Yeah, I think... Mm -hmm. You'll probably snag a lot of archetypes out of the snipe amount of this presentation and be able to help us see how that plays in because your audience is going to be very familiar with that lens of looking at things. Mm -hmm. See, exactly. This quote really sets the tone. And the first thing we're going to do is get into talking about Gnosticism, but I'm going to read another quote just to show you how far back this concept of hyper reality goes. But given in a different context from Plato, we get... If we would have true knowledge of anything, we must be quit of the body. The soul in herself must behold things in themselves, and then we shall attain the wisdom which we desire, and of which we say we are lovers, not while we live, but after death, or if while in company with the body, the soul cannot have pure knowledge. So we can bring this down for a moment, Okay. but there's a couple of things I want to point out about this quote. He's saying we need true knowledge of anything. We must be quit of the body. So right there, as we explore the, uh, the basic foundational ideas of Gnosticism, you're going to see that it's this idea of ascension past reality into some hyper reality or super reality that is the core of what allows this world to be turned into a hellscape. Not that it is a hell, but that it becomes that for people who live here based on living in this simulated world of words. And also real quick, I'm kind of noticing myself echoing back. Maybe 
uh, from your end, but maybe you're muted. Maybe it's just something, an artifact in my headphones. If people in the chat aren't hearing that, I won't worry about it, but I have that audio <laughs> audio file bug thing and I wanna make sure it's sure. perfect. Yeah, it, it sounds good to me. Can you let us know in the chat if you're getting any echo? I hear, I hear none whatsoever, so. And I don't have the um, audio going into the, the mic on this side. It must just so. be me. Uh, okay. That's no problem then. Okay. Something weird going on in my headphones, but. You might okay, be able so to then, jump off and jump on. He, so he says the, uh, the soul in herself must behold things in themselves. So right there, he's kind of already alluding to this anima, which in Jungian psychology, the anima is the female aspect of the soul that is internal to males. But in this older context, we're looking at the, con the idea of a goddess of wisdom. And that's what is trapped, or a, a goddess of truth in a sense, that's trapped inside the cage of the flesh, the material world. And he even goes on to say, to attain the wisdom which we desire, in which we say we are lovers, not while we live, but after death. That means that there's some desire to merge with this wisdom of which they love. Philosophy actually is philosophia. Philo. Philo is love and Sophia is the name for wisdom, but also the name that in Gnosticism is given to this goddess figure that we're going to explore in a minute. So I, that quote is just to show you how far back this goes. It goes all the way back to Plato and people that were teaching him most likely. And it's seated in the secret societies, I think, uh, and always has been as sort of a Michael Tesserion would say is kind of running concurrently with Hermeticism and the two are getting mixed up and conflated. And that's a larger conversation, but let's, uh, we can bring up the next slide unless mm -hmm. you have some response to Plato there, which is, you know, it was, I, I do expected. That's a huge I, quote. Yeah, yeah, I definitely, I definitely did actually that, uh, that, that was the, the big thing. That's why I was dying of cancer uh, on that very philosophy that, that there was this somehow isolatable spiritual element that was independent of the body. The body was low class, especially from here down, right? Like anything from here up was was okay, but uh, this was all this was all a degraded experience to be um, left behind, to to be abandoned. And and lo and behold, when you abandon something, it doesn't do well, and it cries out for your attention. So uh, it became literally the opposite. That that was that was the Gnostic training, which was never uh, really talked about in that language but of course it's entirely embedded in that that the body's a cage for this soul and uh and then it was it was the embodiment that that uh i got my life back so uh, that's all i'll say for now because that's a big story as well yeah and i mean you're completely right though you're you're programming your body to not to that you don't want to be alive anymore if you believe that you need to transcend the body. I mean, it's just like, okay, we can quit now. But let's move on to the next slide. Um, this it. is a quote from Michael, who I just mentioned. This is from his book that I think is a must read. Mm -hmm. It can really help someone either new to philosophy or experienced in philosophy have a lens to look at philosophy through that is grounded in reality and selfhood and nature, more Taoist than anything. But he mm -hmm. says, Mysterium is the notion that there is a higher reality beyond this universe. It is a phantasm with the same date of birth as the ego. Mysterium is an irrational projection and identification with a phantasmagoria invented by minds incapacitated by isolation and fear. Nails I mean, it. <laughs> nails it. Nails it. I mean, please, people, like, screenshot this quote. Think about mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. see Get where that this book exists. Too. Every, get this book too. Yeah, mm -hmm, it is mm -hmm. bombshell after bombshell. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't even go a page without highlighting at least two to five sentences, like every page of that book. There really amazing. I, I only found an electronic copy. Does he have it in print as well? Nope, just electronic, but yeah, there okay. might be an audio book soon. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good book. Uh, so the next slide is just what is Gnosticism? Mm -hmm. We're going to answer that question. I wanted to just show, you know, a Demiurge like character here. Mm -hmm. These are beautiful images. Well done. Yeah, I drew all these pictures myself. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I think this is from some trading card game, I think, like Magic the Gathering. Mm -hmm. Just to point that out as a the fact that like every, the reason why people had a bad vibe about D&D &D is because it has seeds of this thinking in it. But mm -hmm. 
what the sort of like satanic panic Christian zealots don't realize is that their Christianity has the seeds of this in it, at least in the mainstream dogmatized form. There may be other ways to interpret Christianity that are less Gnostic, but Mm -hmm. I mean, there are entire Gnostic gospels that are, you know, considered uh, apocrypha, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you think of uh, this from David Reif? I may be wrong, but Gnostic is from the Gnosis or to know, and mystics are associated with mystery and remain hidden. So wouldn't they be opposed in the face of it? Does anyone think that sounds right? I'm not sure I totally get that, but what do you think? So what he's pointing out is that the word Gnostic comes from a word that refers to knowing, to know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the main thrust of Gnosticism is that through knowledge you will ascend. And this is not completely untrue. That's part of what makes it such a sticky trap, because Mm -hmm. you have definitely got knowledge that can help you live, help you ascend in your life, ascend in the sense of becoming a more full version of yourself. But in the Mysterium sense, we're talking about cults that would pass their knowledge through degree by degree as someone ascends in a hierarchy. And just like Scientology, it's the same exact model. It's confusing to the initiate at the beginning levels, and they get more and more until at later levels, they're even like, okay, we lied to you about stuff. This is how it really is. And it's just a nonstop knowledge trap, like red crumbs through a forest that lead to the evil witch's house where you get eventually boiled or you become want you become the evil whatever the case may be You're, Could it's I a, in? oh sorry and okay and so this is we'll get to more about what the gnosis actually is supposed to be that is helping you ascend because again there's going to be like kernels of truth and big poisonous you know rat pellets mixed in as we go mm-hmm. part of what makes this like a, a difficult subject Can I quickly add something there about lying? Because this is like the bane of my existence. I definitely came here to experience people lying to me. And as we all did, it's not, it's, I'm not unique, but it's a particular thing. And, um, and now even in the truth community, you, you hear people. So, so for, for a lot of us, germ theory has been completely leveled, right? There's nothing left. I, I, I don't live in a world where I'm attacked by microbes. I see it as all just part of the terrain. They, they are pleomorphic. They act like I, if I create an environment for, for the good guys, then they're there. And if I create, clean, create an environment that needs to be cleaned up, they turn into the cleanup crew instead of the, the ones that make me happy. So, you know, it, it, and then, and then, and then this uh, going out and saying, oh, well, people aren't going to be able to handle that. So we'll tell them this lie and then show the doctors saying this and that. So because they can handle that lie and we'll, we'll reserve the truth for later. And I just can't go there. I I don't mean to sound as judgmental as I am, but I think like if they can't handle the truth now, it's not going to, it's not going to go well later when you have to admit you lied to them. (laughs) Right. Well, one of the, this is a, a tangent, but one of the things about these cults that lead people down the garden path is that it's, there's a lot of hypnosis. Even hypnosis has the word gnosis in it. See what I mean? Hypnosis is uh, being used in these cults in, an, in a manipulative way. It's just a tool. It's not actually something wrong. But when you've been fed with dogma in the early degrees, and then you're taken through rites and ceremonies, usually even with psychedelic substances that are designed to hypnotize you and then you later so you have the experience of what it was that you're being uh, suggested through the hypnosis and you might not even realize that's what's happening to you because you think you're doing some secret ritual that somehow aligns the right color with the right direction and the right type of candle and now you can see these spirits but this isn't to say that there aren't entities that one can encounter in astral type experiences but when we're talking about these cults, it's like how much of the mythology that people believe, especially rampantly in the new age about God is this, uh, elementals that, was actually implanted through a, a succession chain of hypnosis from, from uh, high level members to initiate members where maybe even at a certain point, someone forgot that it was made up at the beginning and they're just implanting these experiences in themselves. And then in later, degrees and when someone has gotten further into just even basic stuff like meditation auto hypnosis is a a real tactic that is used by occultists of all stripes to 
put themselves in a suggestible state to manifest certain things magically. And there's something to this, but you're going to manifest some kind of experience and the imagination is a portal to basically the infinite. So my point is that a lot of what passes for high level spiritual knowledge that like Wayne McCroy talks about on his alchemical tech revolution, YouTube channel, where he just reads these rare Freemason books about the different orders of elementals and the name of the King of the fire divas and all this stuff. It's like, this, to me, this is just like ideas about ideas that came from someone else's idea and it's just being pe- played like a game of telephone. And even if you get to an experience of having interaction with that stuff, I've seen I've seen someone hypnotize a guy and tell him, please tell me about when you were abducted by aliens. And this guy who had never been abducted by aliens or never thought he had or had no memories of it, with just that one su- suggestion under hypnosis, had the experience of being abducted uh, fully formed in his mind, told the story of it while under hypnosis, an elaborate story, and then was like messed up for months or years later and never the same again and traumatized by it, even though after coming out of hypnosis, he still couldn't remember the abduction. So if that's possible for people just experimenting with hypnosis and he's meeting entities, how is that different than somebody meeting these Gnostic archons or, or anything that might, or elementals or anything that might be taught in these mystery schools, right? Mm -hmm. So I have serious, serious hesitation to believe anything coming out of these cults that are secretive, that are hierarchical, that are hip, that use hypnosis. And doesn't mean that hypnosis is a bad thing. It's like a tool of any sort. And I, I believe maybe there were mystery schools of the earlier times, maybe in hermetic times, maybe it's just a possibility where hypnosis was used to bring about samadhi states or the feeling of enlightenment temporarily. And maybe use positively the way that someone might break through their own shell using a dimethyltryptamine experimentally in today's day. Mm-hmm. And then you open a doorway to see reality through a wider aperture and it'll never be the same. I think hypnosis could be used in a positive way like that as well for someone who's ready and for someone who's like trustworthy leading them through that. But when it's mm-hmm. done under the pretense of this is like this, this is the ritual you need to do to contact the the water nymphs and the, <laughs> it's like, give me a break. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. To me, it Actually, seems really obvious what's going on. I posted recently on Facebook and said, uh, let me know if you can't be hypnotized, we should be friends. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's a thing. Definitely. So shall I uh, keep going with your um, yeah, we better keep going. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had a feeling this is how it was it was gonna happen. So uh, okay. Let's see if I can get this back to a big version. There sure. Goes. So I took this. We're going to do some definitions out of Webster's 1828. This is an, an important Yay, one because one. it's before. This definition is from before the Nag Hammadi library was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But it's from Latin Gnosticus, to, or the Greek word to know. The Gnostics were a sect of philosophers that arose in the first ages of Christianity who pretended they were the only men who had a true knowledge of the Christian religion. They formed for themselves a system of theology agreeable to the philosophy of Pythagoras and Plato to which they accommodated their interpretations of scripture. They held that all natures, intelligible, intellectual, and material are derived by successive emanations from the infinite fountain of deity. These emanations they called aeons. These doctrines were derived from the Oriental philosophy. So what that description is talking about is more like Kabbalism in a way emanations in a sort of Kabbalistic tree of life way. And again, what's being described here isn't entirely, potentially isn't completely off the mark in terms of how reality perhaps does emanate from source. Perhaps there are layers like this, but we're commenting now on higher dimensions that no one has any real knowledge about that can be grounded in the physical world and given from one to the other. It's all conceptual. Mm-hmm. We need to keep this in mind when we look at any symbol system, any religion, any mythology. These are conceptual things, and they might have even astrology, completely conceptual. Might be useful to use as a mental scaffolding, but we got to be real about where these ideas are coming from. They're coming from us, coming from our imagination, which is also where evil can come from. It's the only place evil can come from, in mm-hmm. my opinion. It's not mm-hmm. there. In nature, mm-hmm. that's kind of one thing that's special about us. Not that imagination is evil, but anyway. So the next slide, we're going to look at the uh, 
I'm just pointing out the Nag Hammadi scriptures is where a new story of Gnosticism started to come about. Sure. And to Cam's it, question I'm there, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious, the Gnostics, the same as the Essenes. I think that the seeds are in many different cults. So mm -hmm, okay. Michael Tesserion's work on this is really seminal. And he would probably, his presentation, if I remember correctly, has more answers uh, about that than you could ever even ask questions for in terms of which ancient groups and cults had Gnosticism as an element, where where the branches went and how it influenced everything. And to be clear, I think that this is the belief system of the ruling class largely. It might not look the same from individual to individual, but what we're really pointing out is the pattern of what Gnosticism does to a person's worldview, because it can come in a lot of different flavors and it doesn't have to be this sort of pseudo-Christian Kabbalistic flavor. There's an entire materialist version of Gnosticism that we're going to get into, and it's a big part of this. But what happened with the um, emergence of these scriptures was that a, a more detailed story about these emanations came about, and uh, I couldn't tell you exactly what's in every not Nag Hammadi scripture or Gnostic text, because there's a lot of different ones. You have the Gospel of Thomas, uh, where in that version of this, the uh, gospel, Jesus actually says, bring forth, if you, you must bring forth what is in you to be saved, basically, which is a totally, like is a totally uh, different view than you need to go to an external savior to be saved. So there's actually like good, interesting nuggets in what are called Gnostic scriptures. What we're really criticizing here isn't everything Gnostic, but the interpretation of the, seeing the world as artificial and fallen and evil. So like, that's important caveat. Hopefully we didn't already turn people off who are like, I know about the Demiurge. I know about <laughs> this is a world as a prison planet. But if that, you know, that does anger people who have a strong religious conviction about these ideas. And we're gonna get into the psychological underpinnings for all that. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we can kick it back to you for a minute before we mosey into some of the more specific details about this Gnostic cosmology. We're going to hit just the major points so that we can then demonstrate them in a bunch of games and show how this is like seeded in our culture heavily. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very good. No, I, uh, you can keep going. There are uh, several non-hypnotizer, uh, hypnotizable people, if that's a word, in the chat. Just want to re rest <laughs> assured everybody we're in good company. And Justin in the chat says, I wish evil were merely a creation within man's imagination. And I want to say that I think that that's actually kind of a Gnostic idea, because when we look at what we're talking about here, it's giving evil a lot more credit as a component of reality than I think it deserves. And I will stand by the fact that I think that evil is done through basically through man's imagination and, uh, and belief more than existing as a natural force. You can't really point at nature doing something in nature and say, there's the evil right? It's like aberrant dissonant behavior that we do. And I'm not, okay, so I will say that there's an element of that that is part of the contrarium, if you will, that is the what generates the material reality. And that's a deeper philosophical question, but that it's still always, and everything in fact is always through the imagination. It's the ground of reality and being, but that's like a big tangent. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll move into uh, showing some of these Gnostic characters, the cast of characters. Mm -hmm. So Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, we already mentioned her. Why is she holding a globe there? Mm -hmm. And in fact, this is actually Sophia or meant to be. This is a image of a person cosplaying a character from a game called Final Fantasy 14, mm -hmm. in which Sophia is a big, bad, evil boss that takes like 40 players to team up to slay her. She's like a, an evil goddess thing. So like, mm -hmm. They're putting this right in the game, uh, but in this case, Sophia is an antagonist, which is kind of, in my opinion, like a clue here. Why is she holding a globe? I, that's just a little, you know, wink, in my yeah, opinion. I don't think exactly. even the one holding the globe knows why in the game Sophia is holding a globe. <laughs> We're going to go into this next picture here. More images from Final Fantasy XIV. This is a, another boss that the players have to fight in a, this massively multiplayer online game. It requires a lot of people cooperating, and that's supposed to be Lakshmi, which is a Hindu character. Mm -hmm. That was named after Lakshmi, actually. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so that's word. their version of her, and she's also like 
demented or whatever, and you have to eat, kill her in the game. Uh-huh. And here's Sophia from the same game, the, the full rendering of her. And uh, she has this weird, creepy head crab thing that she rides around on. And here's this, a picture I found of a tattoo online just for Googling Final Fantasy XIV Sophia. And so here's a, a guy who is identified with this abject creature so heavily that he's put it on his body. And I noticed that if you kind of guess what the tattoo says across his pelvis there, I can't see any other interpretation other than hopeless. That's what uh, that looks like to me. Uh, and I was like, this is synchromistic yes, that this comes up it. in the Google search. This is Sophia. Wow. This is Gnostic, believing in Gnosticism. And this guy doesn't know he is Gnostic, probably. He may mm-hmm. be likely to be an atheist and a materialist and maybe believe in simulation theory, which is just another flavor of the same body hating nature hating lens of cosmology mm-hmm. essentially mm-hmm. so i i was blown away to find this uh to find this creature tattooed on this other creature it's very bizarre <laughs> totally and i just wanted to say that like uh, when jeffrey's talking the the demiurge is an ai system in this matrix construct also called the the me and the my hmm I don't know how to respond to that, but I will agree that there is a strong correlation between the idea of a demiurge and an overarching AI control grid. And that's something that I believe I'm going to be learning more about in Wayne's book, The uh, Cybernetic Messiah. So the demiurge is, we didn't really say so much about who Sophia was. Let me back up. She is an emanation from the pure source or the, the true God, according to the Gnostic cosmology who one day decided uh, because she's so wise, I guess she's even wiser than God, or she is containing all of God's wisdom in some externalized form or something. And she decides that it would be clever to birth uh, a son, essentially create a son that would be a type of replica of the, the true God. And then in, there's many different versions of the story. So I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible, but in the creation of this, sun it also splits the realm essentially splits a part of reality or creates a separate artificial reality that's underneath the true reality of the source god the real god so already i mean could you get more mysteria mysterium than than that concept like please explain to me how you know this is true (laughs) yeah Uh, so to me that's just a wild story and um essentially Sophia protects her son, who is like considered to be the the Jehovah God of the Bible, who is actually like an evil. You think of it as like a child in a playpen who's just smashing the bricks around and doing whatever it wants and having free reign. Mm -hmm. And it's a demented creature that is inherently evil in most conceptualizations. The, in my opinion, it's the Freemasons grand architect of the universe that they actually like venerate Mm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So to move on, to tell a little bit more of the story, uh, I should have just read from this. <laughs> I need to pay attention to what my next slide is so I don't get ahead of myself. But this is an image from a game called Final Fantasy VIII in the same series from much earlier in the late 90s. And this is the, the uh, overarching villain character named Ultimicia, who's trying to create a simulated reality, basically, and her sort of pet that is a monster that she uses to fight that is very lion-like and the lion symbolism is very important to this demiurge character who is also called Yaldabaoth. There's different ways of spelling that or pronouncing that but according to the ancient Gnostic text there's a creator god named Yaldabaoth, Ildabaoth or Yaldabaoth. There's a lot of ways you might pronounce it. It's a definitely a jumble of syllables but he's described as the child of chaos and was the son of Sophia was wisdom in the Gnostic cosmogenesis. Elder Bayoth is called an angel in the ap- apocryphal Gospel of Judas. He is first mentioned in the cosmos, chaos, and the underworld as one of the 12 angels to come into being to rule over chaos and the underworld. Elder mm-hmm. Bayoth is the creator of the visible realm or what we call the matrix society and prince of the creative forces in humans, which he is the father of the modern man in the form of earthly Adam and Eve of the biblical garden of Eden. This is from taken just straight from GnosticWarrior.com. Just grabbed a random source of somebody who's into this, what they're saying about it. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, this is, you know, that's the best breakdown of these two characters. But below Yaldabaoth, he then creates Archons or the Aeons. And so we're going to just go, the Archons are like the rulers, the planetary gods potentially, and they're supposed to also be like kind of evil. And uh, they live in your body as your chakra system and they're keeping you trapped in dense materiality as gatekeepers or something like that. There's a lot of people's interpretations about this. But just to go back to Webster's, what are Archons? A prince. That's what it means in Greek. The Archons in Greece were chief magistrates chosen from the most illustrious families to superintend civil and religious concerns. They were nine in number. Wow. (laughs) Whoops, sorry. Are these gods or are these rulers of a society? Let's go. Let's move on and see here what we can find out. Demiurge, Webster's 1828, Greek, a public servant and work in the mythology of Eastern philosophers, an aeon employed in the creation of the world, a subordinate workman. So here we have very much contradictory ideas here. Is this a public servant or is uh, this actually something that created the world? Or what world did it create? Did these public servants create maybe a legal world, an artificial underworld? Wow, a world of words. Is, wow. This is what I think it's telling us. And so moving on, what is an eon? An age or duration in Greek is what it means etymologically. In the Platonic philosophy, an aeon is a virtue, attribute, or perfection. The Platonists represent the deity as an assemblage of eons. This would be the higher god, not Yaldabaoth. The Gnostics considered aeons as certain substantial powers or divine natures emanating from the supreme deity, performing various parts of the operations of the universe. And here's just an image of the Kabbalistic uh, tree of life here. And these mm-hmm. spheres are supposed to represent these aeons. So we have a lot of conflicting ideas here. Are these archetypes, perhaps? Are these like ways of energy flowing through the nature of reality that come through with these attributes that are given to the tree of life, like mercy and, and uh, all, all of these other these spheres have some, you know, correlation and that's way too much to get into. But what are we talking about here? Are we talking about public servants? Are we talking about Anunnaki? So here's a <laughs> image of Assassin's Creed again. Here are these digital archons here that are running the simulation of humanity. And uh, aliens are gods. How about a little bit of both? And here's why I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain this more in the next slide. By defining the word God, again, from 1828, the supreme being, Jehovah, the eternal and infinite spirit, the creator and the sovereign of the universe. Two, a false god, a heathen deity, an idol. Three, a prince, a ruler, a magistrate or judge, an angel. Thou shalt not revile the gods nor curse the ruler of thy people. That's a biblical verse there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's go back to the Bible, since we have a biblical verse there, and talk about the creation story of, of uh, Genesis. Mm-hmm. Most people don't realize there's actually two creation stories. Mm-hmm. And it's confusing because the words Jehovah and Elohim are used in the original language, but all changed to God and Lord and made out to be sort of a single solitary character. But... Mm-hmm. Jehovah, who is defined as a verb, which is the self-existing life force energy of reality in perpetual self-existence. That's Jehovah, uh, a spirit, an infinite spirit, the eternal and infinite spirit, creates man. That's the first creation. And then in the next chapter, the Elohim create Adam. And Elohim means is taken to mean gods, plural. Mm-hmm. But what are gods? Mm -hmm. This is what we need to understand. We're not talking about, I really don't think we're talking about alien overlords and genetic manipulation. I don't think we're talking about uh, supernatural gods that created man to be our, be their slaves or, or whatever trip you want to go on. Mm -hmm. I think we're talking, this is telling us a story of when man went from being man to having a name and being registered under a magistrate or a Mm -hmm. prince or a ruler. This is mm-hmm. what I think we're being told by the Elohim, which are the gods or the magistrates mm-hmm. uh, exactly. creating Adam and giving him a name. Because isn't that how they run this legal system is with the name. So exactly. one more slide on the oh, subject. And, 
And Interesting. I don't. I hope you don't mind a few though. comments there, but uh, but the 1828 are, are all of the words written in capital letters because that actually makes them mean something else. Again, they're not descriptive; they're illustrative. They become symbols in in that in the capital letters, whether that's intended or or not. I don't know, but uh, I don't know. That's just on the website. That could have yeah. just been a formatting thing that the programmers did and didn't even yes. know what they were doing. Exactly. So I wouldn't I'll think to too much it. of it in that context, but maybe in the fiscal book, you have to let me know. I've got a I've got it now. It's 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 a mega. I'll I'll go grab it. Uh, and then uh, Bruce has a good question about uh, having witnessed the Grim Reaper entity. Would that be an archon? Is this entity mentioned in the Nagamati? What, what? How would you answer a question like that? I have my own take on it, but I think I'm at a point where my answer for how people interact with entities or uh, spiritual experiences is that this. The only way it's going to work is if you decide what it means to you and how you're going to deal with it. Amazing. Uh, as soon as that. I'm telling you that that Grim Reaper entity that I didn't see, I don't know what it felt like. I don't know what it looked like. I don't know the context. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely not going to tell you it's an archon though, bro. I'm not mm -hmm. going to tell you it's some external uh, mysterious force that has a, a numinous power over your consciousness and is holding you here and keeping you from astral projecting and ascending. I think that your health is what keeps you locked in the body. There is a way to be free of the body in a sense, and you can go through amazing innerverse experiences or astral projecting experiences. And that's all personal. That's all you only, that's for you. That is the fruit of your tree of consciousness of selfhood mm -hmm. that is for you to eat. And like when we share those experiences with others too much and too publicly, I think we get less of that fruit because it becomes sort of less pure in the sense that other people's interpretations are now being applied to it. And now instead of having an experience that was for you and from you, you're now putting it through the lens of somebody else. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's my take on it. Uh, I, I've experienced weird stuff myself plenty of times. I've seen entities, I've, you know, poltergeist activity, all kinds of things, but mm -hmm. To me, like the coherence of my health and my body di dictates whether or not these are positive or negative, um, you know, extended consciousness experiences. And at the end of the day, I'm no longer interested in telling people what things are. I'm more interested in helping people see what they're not and what is being fed to them from an authority in, in all kinds of different disguises, right? Mm -hmm. Brilliant. I love that approach. Yeah, definitely. All right, should I share the screen again? Yeah, I just wanted to point out what gods are again. <laughs> if we pull that back up. Archons, judges, princes, rulers, gods. Got the royals on the right there. The dude on the far right, actually, who just recently left his body. Right, my uh, son told me. Mm -hmm. What's his name one again? Of Prince Philip, I believe. Right, exactly. Yep. Amazing quote from him that I love to share with people where he said, this was a long time ago before he was quite that monstrous looking. Uh, he said, if reincarnation is true, I hope to be reborn as a deadly virus so that I can contribute something to the problem of overpopulation. I'm pretty sure I dead on nailed that quote. I don't even think I'm paraphrasing. Oh that guy my said God. that. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Messed up. But um, <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Like drop. Uh, so this is, this is just a, uh, Another picture of an archon here. And this is a huge tangent, but I, when I was looking for pictures of this guy today, I saw once again how in 2012 and 2021, he doesn't even look like the same guy. And all you need to look at is the earlobes. In 2012, they're unattached. And in 2021, they're attached. Maybe it's plastic surgery, and that's why he looks so different. But either way, the point is that these are creatures of fakery. It's a veneer. It's a... Uh, it's not it's not really a ruler <laughs> mm -hmm, these are mm -hmm. fake archons in the fake system so mm -hmm. but i don't know and, what people yeah. think if he's a, like a clone or a, an actor a different individual altogether who knows nothing would really surprise me but i think an actor would be the most likely uh answer and how often they do the halo around the head eh? like that's just <laughs> boring yeah. already right yeah Give so me a break yeah what guys like this are promising us is always utopia and mm -hmm. so it's just around the corner utopia means no place etymologically right 
And think about that legal, like in terms of what we know about the legal system and whether or not we're nouns and what nouns really are. Now they're artificial because places are always jurisdictions and they're always imaginary boundaries. So mm -hmm. we won't have utopia until we're no longer in a place. Just give that some thought because that's the only utopia I can find is uh, free of, sorry, I have a neighbor with a motorcycle. I hope that's not too loud. Mm -hmm. Free of, you know, these person, place and thing identifications. That's the real that's the real fake world of words, but this is, these are my own words here. Whether through religious dogma, governmental promises, or new age ascension cults, the promise of a realer than real reality to come or a perfect society is joy always just around the corner. Nature waits patiently for our realization that we never left reality. We only simulated an artificial world of words, symbols, and mysteria concocted from our own internal dissonance. And I love this picture because the guy's peeking out from under the dome. Uh, <laughs> totally, totally. It's also yeah, kind of Gnostic because he's like leaving the the artificial and getting into the real. You could look at it either way. I think it's just peeking beyond the veil and knowing there's more to life and that this is a, a womb of sorts. But those are all philosophies that people need to like when they look at these images, they should this should be your personal philosophy that resonates in your mind, not like well, what does this person think this means? And uh, go from there. You can listen to other people, but mm -hmm. always make it always make it your own. So the last thing we're going to do before we move into the next topics is just some glaring contradictions about Gnosticism in case these weren't self-evident. These are from Michael's presentation, Gnosticism 1 on unslave.com. Glaring contradictions. Uh, commenting on higher dimensions you cannot possibly know anything about. And I'll just caveat that that if you do know something about it, it's not translatable and it's not probably it's still through the interpretation of your own subjectivity and what you think you experienced. And I know from from having astral experiences and inner world experiences that I only ever have my story of what I told myself about what I saw. Kind of like when you wake up from a dream, if you tell the story of the dream, you remember that story, but you don't really remember the dream anymore. So no matter what of a higher dimension you may experience, not saying you can't experience them, but you can't really know anything about them in the sense that you know things here. There's no consensus reality to know from that space, in my opinion. And there might be commonalities between people's experiences in that space. But again, to me, these are these type of higher dimension experiences. If you even need to use this very problematic higher and lower conceptualization, I look at it more of like core and surface rather than higher or lower, part of the same thing. Uh, you know, those are for you, the fruit of your own tree. Uh, what did Gnostics and Christians actually know about the natural world they demonized? Because this is a point I haven't really made, but if the world is artificially created by this Yaldabaoth character, then it is not, it's an artificial world. It's, it is demonized by these, uh, by the people, people that either consciously or unconsciously believe and internalize this idea. And from the Christian concept, this is Christian dogma. Not every Christian looks at life or reality this way. Many look at the creation as God's handiwork and that it's, you know, if you want to know God, then look at his handiwork. But when you get locked into this, like, man as sinner, uh, the body as lower and base and the urges of the body as evil, you're deep in Gnosticism, buddy. Whether or not you look at the creation as God's perfect handiwork. So mm -hmm, exactly. we need well, to that know that the demonization of the natural world and the body is the key psychological ground for this entire mysteria of, or any mysteria to emerge. Mm -hmm. And it, it also exalts evil far beyond reason. If all mm -hmm. of the reality that we experience is made by an evil God, then it's all evil. And to me, that is way too far uh, giving way too much power to evil. Mm -hmm. And then the and last obvious question, wasn't the lower God created by the higher God? So couldn't he just do something about it instantly? These are mm -hmm. very important, obvious contradictions. But mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to throw in how, uh, and it, 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 there, it seemed like the pandemic brought on a lot of uh, Christians out of the closet, right? That, and uh, and I, went, I went suddenly to God and, and praying, and not that that had been remote from me by any means, but all of a sudden the Bible looked interesting. Uh, fascinating that actually we found that the whole legal path led to the Bible, but but my point really is about how this, you know, there's a lot of evidence for this being Satan's domain. And isn't that the identical agnostic philosophy? Like, even though it's not God that's in that role, but it's there is somebody in that role. 
as the demiurge, and uh, and then and the expression that you know be in the world but not of the world. That sounds very, very. Uh, logical and you know but it but it actually feeds right into this and and I I play with it it's like no I'm in paradise I go outside it's beautiful sun's shining trees are growing I have a, a really blessed life not to say it's without challenges or not without challenges it is I do have challenges but for the most part I have a beautiful life I have beautiful friends I have incredible experiences every single day is rich for me so I, it's hard to call this Satan's world well, well, Beth, Satan means adversary. So mm -hmm. life it will always present you with adversarial situations, people, experiences, and those are for your growth. And that's really all there is to it. It's required for growth. Mm -hmm. There's always got to be, like, on a zodi zodiacal level, the shaitan or the Satan is the opposite sign from whatever the sun is currently in. So right mm -hmm. now in Aries, Satan is Libra. Ah. And uh, I'm... My moon sign is in Libra and my oh, sun sign is in, in uh, really? Yeah. Both Libra moons? Cool. Yeah. My sun is in Aries, so I have that sort of internal juxtaposition going on at all times in a sense in my psychology. So maybe I see it differently, but like the adversary is there to teach us. It's like a teacher in a dojo, right? And it, exactly. you go to the training to receive, not not to receive a beating, but to get put on your toes to learn what you're capable of through the challenge. So when, I, when we say it's Satan's domain and we create this character called Satan that is ruling the world, we have given a bunch, again, ceded a whole bunch of power to evil and away from ourself and mm -hmm. also corrupted our entire view of nature in the process. That being said, what resonates so deeply with people regarding this idea of some sort of demiurge control grid is because this is literally being built in our world right now in artificial systems in this technocratic next fourth industrial fourth reich revolution that is like the believers in this system both consciously and unconscious believers are are creating this system the believers in this worldview are creating it on earth because that's what we do mm -hmm. i mean belief means love Mm -hmm. Belief is an archaic word for love. So what we believe in is mm -hmm. something we love and we're putting our spiritual ah. attention and currency into it at all times. Consciously or unconsciously, what we believe in is, well, put it this way. What, whatever gets done by you that you don't care, it out, care about at all, nothing. You, anything that ever happens in the human world is from the principle of care. So if care and belief are actually very similar and have a similar function, then by just by this deep seated belief that so many people have, and a lot of times unwittingly, we they're creating what they care about by constantly focusing on it, constantly expecting to see it. So the legal system is the perfect example of like maybe the original demiurge control grid, but in this case, it's like the, the demiurge is the organization itself, like the Vatican crown control system itself. But mm -hmm. there's what's artificial in that system is the AI in that system is the, the web of interconnected if then scenarios, statements and laws that cause things to happen bureaucratically, automatically, as if being run by itself with no, like you just swap out whoever you want in the position of this ma middle management job here or this peon job there, but the system's gonna run itself because it has this architecture of language coded into it. And we're seeing the exact same thing with this current revolution where the jobs that they're going to be pushing people into is coding the ones that are still alive in the next five years from now it's going to be one of the main jobs mm. and uh they're already doing that exactly they're already doing that mm -hmm. and whenever if they ever get around to like sending people to retraining camps and reskilling camps it will be to learn coding mm -hmm. and that's to build the very system that like these individuals that we talk about this inverse priesthood these inversive brethren they are actively afraid of death and meeting their maker, so to speak, facing, facing truth, facing reality. It ain't <laughs> getting better. <laughs> yeah. Getting so they do as much, they have this crazy wild belief that they're going to ascend past that through, uh, you know, a digital afterlife of sorts. And that's part of what we're going to get into next. And mm -hmm. so now that we have spent a, a good hour laying the groundwork of uh, what Gnosticism is, we can 
we can definitely keep going on. Oh, sorry, okay, alive in five you. years. What are you talking about, Lewis? Eric says that in the chat. Um, there's a, I can't remember the name of the website, but there's a, a report that was shared around recently, a big military industrial complex database website, starts with a D, where uh, they essentially are, they are mapping out in a database way the different military expenditures and equipment purchases and GDP of one country to another and population counts. And they have a five-year projection on this website that happens to show that there will be only 89 million people in the United States in five years. And mm. so this, wow. I'm, and in the, on the website, it specifically says the reason for this projection is many fold having to do with uh, the fragility of society and the, how collapse will be sort of a cascading effect once enough people have uh, died from things that they're doing right now. And mm -hmm. the very things that they're doing right now, the uh, laboratory animals that have ever received this experimentally died within three years or five years. So mm -hmm. um, window. It's a, it's definitely a crazy idea. I don't like to say, I never just say things like that because I'm doom and gloom. It's like, I see the reality that people are taking this into themselves. They're, they're asking for it. I don't want to see this happen at all, mm -hmm. but we should think about how possible this really is because, um, I don't know. It's <laughs> to me, I don't know how you can do this damage to your body without any attempt or mind to repair it and actually come out the other side. Um, there's always a point where you've like sort of done too much damage to the vessel and you got to try again. Mm -hmm. It's, it's true. Uh, unfortunately the truth. Mm -hmm. I know it very well. Exactly. I mean, yeah, it's not so that you can't do amazing miracles with healing yourself. You can, but it's like, mm -hmm. if you start on the path and you've been so far down into the indoctrination that you're just now starting on the path of trying to figure out what's going on and who you really are. And you got like a month before this stuff kills you going to be tough to like like for you you know you had it took you a long process to finally get to the root of what was killing you and you had, you did a lot to sort of buy time right but there won't be ways to buy mm -hmm. time necessarily mm -hmm. i mean i was so lucky to have a decade of uh of spiritual work behind me before. So I was in and, and, and interest in health and access to a whole variety of resources and practitioners. I'd actually surrounded myself with people that that uh, had had dove into that. So I was very prepared. And it was really fucking hard. And right up until the end, it was one of those classic suspense movies. I was told I wouldn't survive. I, I, I you know, gave in to death, I surrendered to it. And that's pretty much when I had the turnaround. So it's, yeah, it's it's a crazy thing. I was just going to say, so we are entering the second hour. I'm very fortunate at this stage to be able to offer my second hours uh, for free. I think that time will will come to an end. I've, I've got an account at Rockfin, and I think I'm going to start contributing second hours over there. Not immediately. I'm just working my way towards it. But uh, if you guys are enjoying this, if you think this is a, a, a worthwhile thing to to be taking in and learning about, please share it out now while it's, while it's totally public and and, uh, you know, the days are numbered on all of these platforms. So you'll want to definitely visit both. Um, inter Chance, what is your what is your um, website name? I'm just going to put it in the chat. Oh, yeah. Interversepodcast.com. Okay. And there's links to everywhere. You can find me there also on Rockfin. And I'm telling you, I'm really glad that we're going to be able to do all this information because I have that second hour model for premium as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't get I don't I haven't presented this on my own channel. But this is like my main interest for several months is trying to piece this mm -hmm. together. And the pieces do just keep clicking more and more into place. And I think it's crucial now because the thing we're talking about, Gnosticism, is perennial. It comes up again and again in different forms. And I'm about to show you the latest and greatest form in the next section of the, okay. the slides. Okay, let's do it then. Here we go. I'll put the slide back up. Take your banner down. Oops. <laughs> there we go. So here it is. So if you hadn't caught on already, simulation theory is the materialist version of Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. Everyone says simulation theory these days. Hey, you can see it totally rose to popular culture. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I even saved an article. I didn't make a slide on this. I already had so many, but I found an article recently of a physicist who used a computer simulation 
of the solar system to, in his opinion, prove that reality is a simulation. So you're looking at data in a simulation and that's making you think that you're in a simulation. Do you not see the obvious problem with that? Because when you look at reality with your eyes, you can see that you're and feel that you're a part of reality. And so it's like, what lens are you looking at things through to come to these conclusions? But that was a wild article. Um, Elon Musk, one of the most loco people I've ever in, encountered on the internet. <laughs> mm-hmm. His Twitter feed is just full of wink and nod and nudge and poke like, hey, guess what? This is all fake. SpaceX is fake. Uh, this isn't a globe, yada, yada. So he has a, an amazing quote here. Either we are going to create simulations that are indistinguishable from reality or, civiliz- or civilization will cease to exist. Those are the two options. Oh, are they? Is that really the two options? <laughs> Always two options. Im- <laughs> yeah. Amazing, eh? Two pillars. They can't find another strategy. So, yeah. but this is a picture behind you, behind the quote of the movie The Matrix. But that's not Keanu Reeves. That is Will Smith. Because somebody years ago, this is old. They did a deep fake algorithm process to replace Keanu Reeves in the movie The Matrix with Will Smith. Hmm. And uh, this was years ago, and it looked real then. What they can do now is ridiculous and that's what's in the open world the you know public world so makes you think twice about those newsreels you see on cable right like how much of that is even a real person or just could be an actor with someone else's face being put digitally on in the press conference a lot is possible here but they want you to believe that um they, they really want the simulation theory idea deep into your eye consciousness right now it ties to it is the atheist version of gnosticism it's the flavor of the day i think it's even worse thing than gnosticism personally but uh because you know your simulation theory for anyone not getting it is that the simulation the reality is a simulation no different than the idea that it was created by an evil demiurge and is artificial Mm -hmm. uh and you know that would require some master programmer and like to me all you need to do to debate simulation theory is just say why would the programmer of a prison simulation for consciousness program in a way for that consciousness to become aware that it was in a simulation? <laughs> the simulation people are in is in simulated selfhood through personhood and victimhood mm-hmm. and all these things we talked about uh, last week on my show. That's Those are mm-hmm. simulations. <laughs> the simulations yeah. are the social personas that you wear uh, and the social systems that you adhere to. Those are simulations. Those are mm-hmm. all word-based. And mm-hmm. Simulation means hypocrisy or hypocrisy, by the way. Oh, no kidding. In, in the Fun. original Webster's 1828, don't have a slide on that, but yeah. 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 <laughs> it wow. means acting, acting like something you're not. So Very cool. Very it, cool. Yeah. Fun. Uh, even the idea that you can get computer simulation data on the solar system. Like, l- listen to this one. People are aware. The greatest mathematicians and the greatest... Uh, programmers and astrophysicists have all worked for a long time to try to come up with the model in a simulation that tells you how gravity works and what the gravitational universal constant is. They program in different weights and different constants in the math and they can never get a solar system in their simulation to actually behave the way that we observe it in the sky using this made up force called gravity. So I don't know the etymology of normal, Mark. Um, just great question, in, Mark. <laughs> type in etymology of normal. You'll yeah. find out. I'll go grab uh, Mal is, I mean, I can tell you now that mal is bad. It means mm-hmm. uh, negative or bad. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. nor, I don't right. know. Nor, Nothing mal. coming to me. Yeah, yeah, mal would be uh, not, not right, right? And nor, I mean, just on a green language aspect, you're saying... Uh, you're, it's not that. It's neither this nor that, right? So mm. normal, not bad, could be. You're normal. You're not bad. Oh, oh, yeah. Right, right. There you that's go. Well done. <laughs> but there could be more to the story in terms of where the word come, came from. But that's how I look at language, and I think it's massively helpful to think about what it sounds like it's telling you because your your si- sort of right brain side is receiving the information of it, what's in the word on all levels at once while you're conscious mind and your left brain is focused on just what you think it means in this context. And so you need to always have like, can't just be focused on the point in front of you. You need your peripheral vision and you that applies to words big time. Mm-hmm, 
So I've got another Tessarion quote here. Okay, let's lay it on us. Mysterium runs in a similar way to a computer program, one almost impossible to turn off, uninstall, or delete. Man's world certainly affects his mind, and his mind affects the world in which he lives. The world changes because of thinking. However, if man's thinking is Mysteria possessed, the world is certain to take on an aberrant complexion, as it has done. Brilliant. Just another bombshell quote. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, and the, that's it for the, the section right here. We're going to move into talking about symbolism from within video games. But if you have some comments or want to address some of the chat stuff, we can take another quick little detour there. Sure thing. Yeah. So I, I don't have anything exactly more about that. It, it's all ringing very true. And, you know, since I started looking into this a week and a half ago or something, and to tell you the truth, I've been looking into it much longer because... I I was abandoning the Gnostic path. I didn't I, I didn't have the words for that, but I I knew it. I was moving away from you know much of the New Age and all of that kind of um, philosophy and really weeding it out of my work. And and you know there was a time where I would refer to archetypes as if they were embodied that they, they were maybe creatures or they were things. And now I'm so clear that's that's definitely not what's happening, and it, it's always much simpler, right, than than the that convoluted, complicated thing that uh, that we're dealing with. But you know, so so now it's is a, a continuous process of my world making more sense, and this is another, you know, to to have words like mysteria and and to to be so clear as you are about what that Gnosticism has done to us in our worldview. It's beautiful. And we were driving along the other day on a, a little road trip. <clears throat> and uh, and someone said, like, hey, I can see the Matrix, or, or I saw the Matrix when, when the sky broke up under a chemtrail. Like, like, maybe they're using chemtrails to hide little busts in the Matrix. And I'm like, nah, it's not a simulation. I don't believe that. But but I but I did see the the simulation within the right because they 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 want to go out of their way to have us believe it's a simulation at every turn, whether it's the games or whatever it is, right? That's right. Yeah, and we're gonna get into games now. This is the Let's fun part. It. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> some of it will be fun. Some of it will be like, God, that's really in there. But okay, so this is a slide. Uh, the title slide virtual unreality and here is uh, from distraction from simulacra this is what elon musk is talking about they become more and more realistic super mario world in 1990 quite a harmless game the violence was just you know your little pet dinosaur would maybe eat a little bad guy or you jump on their head and they go poof uh but <laughs> still uh and I'm, let me just say i've played so many games in my life if I was to like say people are bad for playing games, I would be pretty hypocritical. I still dive into some gaming here and there, but my obsession level is no longer ruining my life like it was when I was in my early 20s and as a teenager. That being said, like I think there can be a great work of art. I even think there's um, beautiful elements to this very dark game, Cyberpunk 2020, where guess who that is, by the way? That's Keanu Reeves from The Matrix. See how they use the same individuals to reinforce a similar type of uh, story but an updated version and we'll get to cyberpunk later of i got a lot of do. <laughs> yeah of course they do because they they become symbols they become uh, that's like what the icon is or you cannot look at keanu reeves and not think the matrix exactly yeah and the character he plays in that game is a uh, an ai who was created mm -hmm. from a human being that uh, was like some technology they call soul killer, where they like kill the person and then transfer their consciousness into a digital prison and keep them forever and torture them. Yeah, so Fun it's pretty stuff. Gnostic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, the first game we're gonna break down is a different one. Uh, this is a really popular game right now. It's called Final Fantasy VII. Mm. And it is one big Gnostic allegory. Mm. I will not be even close to able to go through all the stuff about this game that is relevant to the programming we're talking about, but we will touch on what we can. But the first thing I want to say about this game is that it came out in 97. So I was pretty young and I even remember playing with my friends, but running around as these characters from this game before I had even played it. So I knew who the characters were before I even played the game. And I don't know how much of that is still typical for modern kids. They 
you know, watch a lot of YouTube videos of other people playing games as much as they themselves play them, or sometimes exclusively just watch other people play them, which is, I mean, the uh, sort of phenomenon of grown men streaming video game play to young children while making very low brow or even kind of gross jokes. And that's their, their like uh, income stream kind of sickens me. Yeah. <laughs> In my opinion, I think that's pretty, I'm not saying all game streamers are like bad for being a game streamer. I just mean like that, that is a, that's going to be more of a job in the future. YouTube promotes that Facebook promotes that heavily. And uh, anyway, so this game was heavily entrenched in people's imagination and in their worldview without them even knowing it from how big of a deal it was in the nineties. When I was a kid, I remember how excited I was to go over to a friend's house and see the actual real game and not just be talking about it and looking at the little manual that comes with it that someone brought to school. So Mm -hmm. this is pretty dark right here. Uh, Article from Vice. When fandom goes wrong, the dark tale of the Final Fantasy house. I'm just going to read from this. It's just a few excerpts from the article that tells you a lot more than this. It's a very crazy story. The bizarre story of how a young woman turned a group of video game loving misfits she met online into an abusive mini cult. Joanna was 20 years old when the Final Fantasy VII house began in 2002. Sid told me and had arrived in State College to live with her girlfriend, Rachel. According to Sid and McCullough, another former member, Jen- Joanna's background beyond that is de- tough to pin down. She went out of her way to obscure her origins, spinning tales of secret government programs and training camps in the desert. Nate, a former, res- a former friend of Joanna's, said that she spent time at Cross Creek Residential Treatment Center in Utah, a defunct reform school that has faced lawsuits for its alleged brutal, widespread physical and psychological abuse of teenagers in the program. Oh, Jesus. This is child trafficking and indoctrination, right. and then they, make, they send little monsters out into the world to create little cults and mess up more people. This is oh, what happens. God. So anyway, she created this thing called the Final Fantasy House, which was kind of not on purpose, but she had a lot of roommates. And basically what they were doing here is uh, she told them all which character. She convinced them they they were all reincarnations of fictional characters from this game that they could actually be. Yeah, it's that insane. And and then she just uh, like abused the shit out of them. But it's a long story. Look this up if you want to read about it. There's a lot more to it. Trying to go fast here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But here's the big bombshell. Of the the person who was like sort of the main hero of this article they're talking about who was a victim of this she says sid realized that joanna's talk of reincarnation multiple personalities and magic was not role-playing from what he could tell she actually believed the stuff so this is someone using mysteria to web manipulate to to create a manipulation web of multiple people and also tying it right into the hooks of their childhood nostalgia for this video game that they all liked. And it's, it, here's another example. <laughs> I know the story's bad. We're going to move on. <laughs> this one's equally gross, but it, less psychologically horrific, maybe. I won't read all of this, but this is an article about a guy who uh, played the game Final Fantasy VII. He, beat, he hit level 99 before the first boss. So what that means is like as you play the game, there's a progression. You defeat enemies and complete challenges, and your characters level up. We all know this concept because it's being put into society now in like the stores you shop at and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's a social engineering thing. It's a, a dopamine drip thing. But in the context mm-hmm. of this game, it was kind of an innocent idea. It's just like what these games were like. Anyway, um, this guy, just because he had nothing better to do, he spent two years running around in the very first area of the very first level of the game, fighting the weakest enemies that very, like basically you had to get millions and millions of experience points to get to level 99. And later in the game, things would give you more experience points, but he stayed in the first area and did two years of the same exact thing over and over again and never turned off his PlayStation. Uh, Over 500 hours, he said, just to do this achievement that means nothing. So, See the headline? Player gives life meaning by hitting level 99 before first no, boss. No. And here's the quote. This is the quote from the guy who did this at the bottom. And this guy's a hero online. Like people still talk about this. Life does not have inherent meaning. To say that our lives are pointless and our achievements meaningless is to state the obvious. No matter how grand our achievements or how broad their scope, time turns all to dust and death destroys all memory. 
But that does not mean we cannot ascribe our own meaning to what we do. It is because nothing has meaning unto itself that we are free to create meaning, to make metaphor, and in doing so reflect on ourselves and our world. Like, now, this is not a complete, he's not totally off with this, but mm-hmm. it's just like twisted into a nihilism that is mm-hmm. obviously, like, again, it's not even wrong for him to have done this. Like, it's yeah. not wrong that he spent his time doing this. Mm-hmm. We're just examining the psychology of why someone would do this. You know, like, mm-hmm. why, why is this their life and not 500 hours walking around a park in real life instead of the same room in a video game? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, there was one point I was going to make about the the achievements in life that are, um, you know, they take a certain amount of effort and staying power and you got to really want it and there's going to be work and everything. And I, I heard that video games were rigged so that it was always less effort because there, there's still effort in, in a video game, like you're engaged, you have to think, you have to pay attention. And, and it was always substantially less effort to make um, the amount of achievement so that by the time you hit the real world and you saw what it takes to go and build a business or write a book or whatever it is, you're like, nah, I'll just go go get my dopamine hits off the gaming because I it, it's too much work in the real world. Yeah, games used to be so hard that they would usually have cheat codes where you could activate what's called God mode and just be invulnerable in the game. Mm-hmm. And they games have gotten gradually easier and easier, and the mechanics have become more and more point exactly where to go, hold your hand, and tell you everything in the simplest, concise, like interface that you're just literally following uh, stimulus response cues. And that's the definition of a hero now, according to modern games. Is the hero is just like a mercenary who does whatever anybody tells them to the exact letter in exchange for money or food oh. or treasure. No. This is the gig economy. They're building the gig economy. Right now, someone can make more money as a Grubhub driver than in a skilled job. Mm-hmm. This mm-hmm. is the they're pushing us towards this servile, unskilled, ser- e- taking turns being each other's servants and slaves type of economy mm-hmm. where everything that's substantial that's being done is automated, computerized, and mechanized and in the hands of the masters or the owners. Yeah, it's why so they yeah, want to kill so many of us. So games used to be hard, and now it just holds your hand. And you're exactly right. That's social engineering to condition people that only the things that are handed to you with a cookie cutout hand railing path that's obvious and lit up is the only way that life should ever go. And you should never have challenge or struggle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And I love the fact that you know you you finish a game, and life's not like that. It's a spiral. Right. If if you finish your life, you're. It, I think you have to keep going from everything I I've seen for myself, and when you reach a certain level, it's very humbling because all you see is that there's a new level to reach, and it's it, it's it's about uh, the the non inverted version of servitude. It's actually about serving, right? Not being not being the slave, the dumbed down automaton, but by cultivating your gifts and and bringing it to the world and finding out how to actually bring benefit from your existence to your people. Eric in the chat pointed out that that's not true yet as far as he's making better money as a construction skilled hand. I'm not saying every skilled labor job is worse off than Grubhub. I'm saying that there are skilled labor jobs that pay less than and not necessarily skilled labor either like clerical office type jobs. There's a lot of things that you could get a job doing right now that require some human input and ability rather than I'm not hating on Grubhub drivers being clear here. I'm just saying this is the economy of the future is this gig economy and it's designed like games because these are people raised on games. And that's basically how Grubhub works. Uh, uh, An opportunity pops up, you accept the quest and you go do it and you get the reward right then. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. it's exactly like a video game. And there's, there's even one, I heard about the other day that pays people to drive around and assemble other people's furniture for them. This is all going to be this way. Like, and it's not even, it's it's sort of like an age of Aquarius thing. It's not that that in itself has to be bad or I'm not saying that's evil. I'm just saying this is the direct, this direction has been pre laid out, preceded, and we need to be aware of all that it entails. So that's it. I mean, like hopefully even, not coming across judgmental about anything I'm talking about. I'm just trying to look at it with clear eyes and Mm -hmm. help others do the same. And it's up to you to decide what to make of it. This is just the pattern. Yeah, it's it's not... uh... 
it's it's never personal. We're ta- not talking about. In fact, it's the exact opposite. We're looking at the the bigger trends and uh, and archetypes in the process. So everybody's life is unique, and you are the one that has to decide: Is this my beautiful life? I just got off the phone with somebody before we did this who they went for most of their life feeling like they just needed to fulfill the um, you know the 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 demands on them and that as long as they could just create some way to get by that was good enough but all of a sudden it's not right and life changes and all of a sudden your your soul's pushing up going like no you cannot die with this in you you have to serve in this way or do this outrageous thing and you know it, it's almost scripted th- that moment of awakening when when that realization comes in so it's it's so personal yeah, when you get to the point where you finally know what you want, in a sense, or who you are, then it's like there's no other choice. It's a weird paradox. Mm-hmm, there's only mm-hmm. the choice of what you would have chosen. But I know, then when I you know. don't know yourself, you're like, I don't know. What do I do? I don't mm-hmm. know. What do I mm-hmm. do? So those mm-hmm. are like, it's a bizarre paradox, but uh, freedom is definitely self-determination. And yeah. that's a, it is it comes down to a choice too. It's like not a destiny. It's like when I think about who I am, I'm pretty sure if life was a video game and I was designing my character, I would probably design a character like this guy. But <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> that doesn't mean that it's a simulation. It means that I am myself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like Beautiful. really simple. Beautiful. That's amazing. So good. Let's not. So let's rock through some more um, slides here. I'll try to go quick All through right. the Final Fantasy VII ones. This one's so deep with symbolism. It's ridiculous. All right. A part of the plot revolves around this calamity in the ancient past, a meteor that like half destroyed the planet there's a lot of catastrophism ideas in these uh sort of gnostic and and pseudo gnostic religions and mythologies too not saying there was no catastrophe actually definitely not saying that but in uh, tesserion's work he also connects comet symbolism to goddess cults of the ancient world and not the nice variety like the sacrificing huge quantities of wild animals and uh, men and children type of cults and so the the comet symbolism sort of represents like the the hair of the goddess and the great kali destroyer uh symbolism is all tied up with that so and then of course this game doesn't disappoint because uh the main villains of the game are these characters called jenova and sephiroth so if you know anything about kabbalah you know that the sephiroth are the spheres here Mm -hmm. and jenova is one letter off from jehovah right (laughs) And so this guy, Sephiroth, in the game the game story, he's basically like the Demiurge stand-in. And Genova is his mother, who is an alien, godlike creature that hit the planet on this meteor and is basically trying to hijack the planet and turn it into a vehicle for her to go to other planets and hijack those planets, I guess. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so there's Genova slash Jehovah. Mm-hmm. And if you get in, again, into Sarion's work, he shows this and lays it out brilliantly. But if you get into these... This Jehovah character, uh, historically, he actually had a consort that was like a war goddess that did the dirty work of like the bloodthirsty stuff for him. Mm. So there's a like it's the New Age wants to glorify a, a goddess over the concept of a god, but like my point is here that in the past both have had a, a bad run of it. Like <laughs> goddess cults, matriarchal cults, patriarchal cults are mm-hmm. all still cults right like Mm -hmm. so anyway there's a lot of kabbalah symbolism in this game uh move forward there's a lot more i could say about these Mm -hmm. characters Uh, but quick comment also just how highly sexualized the the uh characters always are in in video games i mean some exceptions that are that are much more uh maybe young younger audience geared but but it's yeah, they're they're all they're always time. hot and have this crazy, crazy uh, figure and uh, you know n- nakedness and the 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 V neck that goes down to the belly button or worse and you know like what do you make of that? Oh, we'll get there. Okay. Um, that's a little <laughs> a little ahead of a slide, so I don't want to. I'll just get to that in a second. Okay. Uh, these same two characters in their like final forms later in the game. We have a very Luciferian looking character and a very Catholic like the Genova turns into this monster on the right. Uh, and so there's kind of a role reversal, but the, in the further you research Gnosticism, you find out that the Sophia and the Yalda Bayath character, which one's like the good one and which one's the monster, is pretty, inter- it gets very 
sketchy, like who's who, or if they're even the same thing. So mm -hmm. that's because it's hysteria, people. It's ideas about other people's ideas about ideas. So it's going to be contradictory everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. uh, the main character of this game is a dude named Cloud. So that is Zodiac Sky Clock symbolism. He's got golden spiky hair, like the rays of the sun. He moves Cloud, the Skywalker program. This is just like Star Wars. Goes up against Shinra Corporation, which is an evil mega corporation that has also become the government of their world. Mm -hmm. And uh, Shinra in Japanese is very interesting. I did a, I've done a much deeper etymological breakdown of it, but one of the best interpretations etymologically of that word is like divine net or divine snare. And the idea is that they're creating these giant rea reactors that suck the life force energy out of the planet, which is like it's etheric energy in a way. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the planet would be sort of the god that they're ensnaring or netting. And it's very, you know, an obvious sort of allegory for oil as the blood of the earth and not as smashed up dinosaurs. They're trying to tell you this is life force energy that comes out of the planet to power all your stuff. You're cannibalizing your world. And that's also part of the programming that they want people to receive is to feel that they are part of the reason why the earth is dying. And, uh, yeah, the Hebrew letter Shin. There's another aspect of it. Like I can't even slow down. To, we won't get through everything. There's so much in this game. If you want to see me break it down deeper, I did that on Enslaved last year. This game specifically got a lot into it. But mm -hmm. the main city of this world is Midgar, or was it Midgard? And even the main character, Cloud, is from a place called Niflheim, which is like straight up taken from Norse mythology. Both of those words are. Yes. They can't have you find out that these big game developers, they're not very creative sometimes, and they mostly just like to cannibalize from a mythology that's obscure enough that the young child won't have heard about it yet and will think it's original. Mm -hmm. Or maybe that plays on something deeper resonating in us archetypically because we do carry some type of uh, you know, epigenetic memory forward. But this big city is uh, you know, the technocratic city of the future. It is a big metal plate and underground is an underworld where the poor people live and on top of the plate where you can see the sky is where all the rich people live so mm -hmm. it's a segmented society that's basically the type of world they would love to create for uh right now i think and also a, a little wink and a nod that under the cities of today there are cities underground i just had in the town i live which is only 180,000 people on when college is in session not a big town there are miles of tunnels under the city mm -hmm. miles and miles of tunnels and buildings underground that you're not mm -hmm. allowed to go into unless you happen to be a delivery driver delivering grubhub like my friend who works for grubhub was and he secretly filmed it even though you're not supposed to Ooh. so now i have footage of this underground complex and he even got me a map because they gave him one to find the destination to deliver the food so wow synchronistically that just fell in my lap but Anyway, we got to move forward. Uh, that's right. a whole nother rabbit hole of like, what is this continent? What was here before? What buildings are on top of other buildings? How's this all layering? But uh, in this game, the uh, main characters actually blow up reactors to try to stop the, uh, they like become eco-terrorists. So there's that idea. And then at one point, the company blows up an entire section of the city and blames it on the eco-terrorists. And it's a false flag. So they're telling you in the 90s that the government and the corporations do false flags. Before 9-11, they're telling you this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we got to move wow. forward again. We got we to keep going. But this game is chock full of the stuff. And if you have thoughts on that, yeah, we'll give pause for a second. No, go for it, please. Okay. So to the sexualization concept you brought up, this is one of the main characters of the game. On the right is a screenshot of her original design. Uh, from the 90s on a PlayStation with bad graphics. Do you see how ridiculous that is? It is awful. They actually it's remade so this game and it came out last year. Mm -hmm. And it was a big deal that it was remade. And as you can see, they reduced her bus size greatly, but they actually had to be told to do that mm -hmm. by their uh, by the reaction of fans not accepting the completely unrealistic version anymore. Oh, exactly. That's just disgusting. So okay. on the left, there's people cosplaying as characters from the game. Again, that's harmless. I just wanted to show that people heavily identify with these characters. Mm -hmm. Tifa. Her name is Tifa. She is a hand-to-hand -hand fighter, a pugilist, if you will. And the name Tifa is almost the same as Tifa Ret, which is one of the Sephiroth of Kabbalah. Ooh, it and is Antifa. The, and Antifa. That's, yeah, that's Antifa. Think about being anti-Tifa. 
anti Tiferet because Tiferet is the emanation or the aeon of beauty and masculinity in this mm. conceptualization. Mm. Wow. So she's the beautiful one and she's the hand to hand fighter who can kick your butt with martial arts. So I'm pretty sure they're talking about Tiferet when they call her Tifa. I don't think that that's a stretch, right? Yeah. Like they are trying to seed some ideas here. And mm -hmm. I never thought about Antifa being anti Tiferet, but ain't that the truth? The opposite, the, um, opposition to beauty and masculinity i've never seen more opposition to those things than today's world exactly and this is you know while i love a, a female warrior just for the romance of it but uh but that's the inversion that they're they want they want the king heroes to be the the nurturers and they and they want the the women to to step in this role of, of warrior and king and leader and all that kind of stuff and, and you completely disable society that way nobody's good at anything what, what they're doing yeah, so in the game, Cloud, the main character, is constantly led by the nose by the female characters, and he doesn't really make a lot of decisions, even though he's ostensibly the main character and the leader of the group. Uh, and Michael has a lot of context about this particular slide on the, the unslaved version of no, this look conversation. At him. He's, he's arm candy. That's all, that's all, right? Yeah, pretty boy <laughs> arm candy. And a very effeminate guy himself, and there's even... Um, a very large segment of the game that is all about finding the right things you need to play dress up and be a cross dresser to progress in the storyline because you need to go incognito and be very convincing. Hmm. Wow. And is, so, are th so these some of the games that you can um, uh, customize your genitals? I oh, no, that we're, not we'll that we'll get there. That's a okay. different game. All That's right. Cyberpunk. Oh, boy. That's why we have to hurry so we okay. can get to that. That juicy <laughs> genital customization. <laughs> Uh, so moving forward, another female character is just, I'm just trying to show a lot of evidence at once. Her name is Aerith. Aerith means flower in Hebrew. She's like uh, an, from the bloodline of the ancient people who were wiped out by this alien invader, Genova, when the meteor hit. Hmm. Also, Aerith is a near anagram for Earth. And uh, I believe it also in a different biblical account was the name of a river of some sort or a stream. So there's a lot of context to this name. I just want to show that like all the main characters in this game, the names are very specifically chosen. It's not random at all. Mm -hmm. And then this character being sort of a Christ like figure because she's the redeemer of like, she's able to make the flowers grow in the city where everything is me mechanized. And she's the, got the only flowers in the entire dead technocratic transhuman future city. Uh, and then of course, in the middle of the game, one of the most iconic moments of all gaming history, she gets murdered while praying on an altar at ancient ruins by the main villain. And uh, she's her body is submerged in the water and sinks as they say goodbye to her. And it's a traumatic moment for a kid who's not used to their beloved characters actually getting murdered. And by surprise, like it's a it's a peaceful moment and it's a like a little movie in the middle of the game. And then he just drops down and kills her and uh what no one who played that game as a kid doesn't remember this moment as being wow. a really big deal to them and there were there are still like conspiracy theories online today in the gaming world about how to find the secret ending where she actually lives or gets resurrected like which doesn't exist there is mm -hmm. i mean this is the story of the game that's what happens and mm -hmm. there's also some talk that in the remake they're like doing this weird meta commentary of the their own game where like it's aware of itself as a remake in this strange sense and like they're changing the future so the storyline might change in the remake which to me just sounds like their way of creating a convoluted explanation why they're going to change into even more wild symbolism that didn't exist in the original mm -hmm, mm -hmm. just another but it's all way just to traumatize and traumatize children right no it's just a game <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just grabbed that cutscene screenshot from the game because, like, I just thought the rose symbolism and the finger over the lips. There's a very secret society feel to this picture, but yes. Now we move on. That game is a huge can of worms, and I did my best to be concise, but there's a lot more there. Cyberpunk is the the real, real meat and potatoes, transhuman, gnostic game of the current like game cycle. This came out just in November of last year. As we mentioned earlier, it was rushed, even though it wasn't completed, mm -hmm. to the point where they actually had to refund the game to console purchasers because it was unplayably broken when it mm. first came out. Wow. And they fixed it up with updates later, but 
Uh, this game depicts the transhuman future in all its glory. And I'm going to read from an article here uh, from the table. Okay, so the game came from a tabletop RPG, kind of like Dungeons and Dragons, but it was called Cyberpunk 2020. And then the game comes out in 2020. But the game is Cyberpunk 2077, so they pushed it out a little further. In the description of the world of 2020 from the writer of the game back in 94, the description, according to the supplemental book, begins with the uh, title Diversity and Unity and then proceeds to describe what is unmistakably the time we live in today. It is from the game manual. It is now accepted among historical scholars that in the decades before the collapse, America suffered from the sickness of racism and cultural identity. Everyone wanted to be seen as special. Every group had to be equal to or preferably better than its neighbors and fought to protect its special rights. If anyone had something that someone else wanted, they were painted as racist, sexist, elitist, or worse. The divisive me first attitude eventually tore the fabric of American culture apart and caused it to self-destruct in a fireball of competing ideologies, none of which truly recognized each other's validity. Diversity led inexorably to anarchy. Wow. In 94, he wrote that about 2020. Mm. Interesting. Like yeah. they planned it or something. <laughs> or that guy just saw what was going on and maybe he's right. just a guy that makes games because it wasn't a big deal. Cyberpunk wasn't a big deal until this large game studio picked it up and remade it into a video game. It used mm. to just be something people were playing with dice and they were into like the idea of cybernetics and tech because it was cool and edgy back then and hadn't gone as far with this thought experiment yet. Right. So I'm going to show some screenshots from the game because uh, it's a big city in this game world and the ads throughout the game city tell you a lot. Do you hate your meat? Get some body implants. Or food in this world is all artificially grown lab meat. Try our new meat delight paste. That gives yeah. me heart palpitations to look at. We'll move past this one. I'm sorry. This game <laughs> That's is, okay. No, it's just like, oh. This is grosser in my opinion. Mm. Be your best self. It's a beer ad so is your meat a temple or is it simply a product commodity tool or prison that's the mm -hmm. question i want to ask everybody mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what exactly. we're seeing here is body dysphoria that's it moving into the next slide before the game even came out it was already under fire from the trans community for not representing trans people well enough mm -hmm. again this is not against trans people i think that anyone researching this stuff that we talk about in shows like yours will know that we're just looking with unclouded eyes to see that there's some sort of push to create the idea of transgenderism in a larger scope than what it would naturally be occurring in humanity, in my opinion. But that's, mm -hmm. you know, people can have their own opinion about that. But the fact is that there is, the media does poke and prod at companies that don't play ball with this stuff. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. originally exactly. the game didn't have the ability to be trans as a character but they got a lot of flack and then they made that possible and um let me read a little bit from this article the idea that people could modify their bodies to actualize their truest internal self was cyberpunk as hell to me writes non-binary cyberpunk fan edison potter in an email to the daily dot it's a common refrain among transgender and non-binary cyberpunk fans growing louder as mainstream movies fail to catch a clue we're going to skip ahead a little bit, but uh, modern cyberpunk is not living up to the genre's subversive roots with a con conservative adherence to old tropes like sexy droid girls and noir detectives. There's a distinct lack of imagination, especially when it comes to gender identity. Considering cyberpunk's unique popularity among transgender sci-fi fans, this seems like a missed opportunity. Potter notes that Better representation, representation is a long time coming. To give you a frame of reference, non-binary people have always existed. Genders outside the binary were found in almost every society dating back thousands of years. I didn't know that, that when I was 10, 12, 15, even 18. I experienced dysphoria without a word for it, just a deep discomfort with many aspects of my body. Mm -hmm, it was mm -hmm. easier to imagine myself as a cyborg than my birth sex because it was the closest thing to not male or not female I had as a concept. He just wow. spelled it out for you. Wow, amazing. Yeah, no, I, it was tragic the day that my son articulated that uh, he never feels right inside himself, right? And that's exactly what you're describing. Yeah, it's not good. It's not good. No, 
No, definitely. And that that's, you know, the, the beauty is that if you have that body dysphoria, it really is a, a very fertile ground. All your energy is tied up in that dysphoria. And all you have to do is go through it with a little bit of uh, skill and technique to, to get to the other side without getting lost. Um, but it's, it, you know, you can harvest that as I'm not sure if that's the best word, or I'll always use that word. But it's it's energy, it's electromagnetic force. So you don't have to just feel like, oh, now I'm like stuck in this reality, you're not. Flat Accord Music made a good point in the chat that this is exploiting people's insecurities and self loathing. I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, so this I'm not going to read much of this slide, but the developer CD Project Red CDPR says in this headline, we really want to make cyberpunk inclusive, something everyone is comfortable playing. So after they got all this media flack, they changed things in the game. So you don't choose I want to be a male or female character anymore. You just choose a body type, which means you can have whatever combination of genitals with other body parts that you want and face types. Everything is swapping with everything else. There's no gender in the game anymore. There's just what your body type is, which means that you could have parts from both things and to, to the point where you actually get to see the uh, genitals of your character when you're creating the character and change how that looks like circumcised or uncircumcised or your member is a robot machine thing or you, you're flat like a Ken doll there. All of those options are there. And I uh, yeah. just want to point that out that that was their way of making everyone feel comfortable playing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It wasn't originally even the way it was going to work, but... Mm -hmm. Like Lego people? <laughs> There's a character from the game. I just want to point out how much of yourself can you replace and still be real? Body parts are archetypes. Behavior is also nature. Man must decide what version of nature he wants to be. Corrupted archetype or sanctified temple. So what I mean by that is all these behaviors and all these perspectives they're implanting in people and people are accepting because of their self-loathing is all changing their nature, which is their behavior, which is their their body and the way their body expresses different things. And just like if you were to, if you had an axe that you built out of a, a piece of wood and an axe head and you put it all together and you used it for a few years and then the axe head broke and you had to replace it with a different one. And then later the actual handle broke and you replaced it with a different one. Is it the same thing that you had before? This is the type of question we need to ask when it comes to like swapping out our body parts. What, mm -hmm. because our, we have this idea that we're a mind inhabiting a body like these things are separate and it can be experienced in a way somewhat separate, but you're never not in a body. Even the universe itself is just a larger aspect of the body that you're in. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's a, so what are we doing here? What is going to happen to the larger body the universe if our behavior and our thinking is leading us to do this type of thing to our body. Now, I don't yeah. think it's possible to have a, a head on a, a cyborg body like this character here. I think a lot of this is pipe dreams, mm -hmm. but the, the point is what this does to you psychologically to look forward to this type of thing. And like, I can't wait for the robot legs and all that Pro prosthetics are not evil. If someone needs a prosthetic. That's not a problem. If mm -hmm. you, someone's body is their body, if they feel like their body is really not complete without a prosthetic part, Okay, go for it. But why is this what people are thinking and feeling now? We need mm -hmm. to get to the root of that. Not to judge people for wanting to do this, but like we need to understand. That's it. And uh, I'm going to show a couple slides from the tarot presentation because this game Cyberpunk had a complete tarot mm -hmm. in it of mm -hmm. transhuman images, really creepy stuff, corrupted versions of these deeper archetypes. Uh, what was the purpose of the tarot in the game? It was hidden as graffiti throughout the world on okay. different walls in different places. And it okay, was just so like not little... called tarot. Mm -hmm. right, well, the character recognized it as the major arcana if you chose to pursue the quest. And there's a character that will like read your tarot cards, but it uses these images like you see the one on the right here. Look mm -hmm. at the lovers on the right compared <laughs> to the lovers on the left. Yeah. And there's a lot to this inversion of symbolism, and you can get into those videos I made about it that will also help you understand what the meaning of the original hermetic meaning of these cards was supposed to be uh, by looking at what it's not supposed to be. But we won't linger on this for time's sake, but this is in the game, an entire major arcana of, and here I included this one because that's Sophia and Yaldabaoth right there on the strength card. Mm -hmm. uh, the goddess and her little lion cub. Uh, and 
the Gnostic version of it on the right is far less beautiful because even the concept of wisdom birthing the force, the industrious aspect of our consciousness of ourself, that which tinkers with the world and tries to make it better. These are our archetypes within us that the demiurge is the part of us that wants to work on the external world because we don't feel at home in it. But the problem is we don't feel at home in ourself and I'm doing all that work to try to repair, you know, paint, move the deck chairs around on the Titanic or whatever, paint the walls of the asylum. You're not addressing the root problem that's within yourself, which is the way you're thinking. And if you could change the way you're thinking about life, then you can make all sorts of things happen in the external world, but you're actually moving internally. So this is a larger topic and these tar cards are so really crazy. We will, I will ha happily link that in the chat later uh, where they can watch those videos. They're, it's pretty deep stuff. But the last okay. thing about cyberpunk that is very important is digital ascension because this is the gnosis again. The idea that people can transfer their consciousness into a machine world, a virtual reality, and live there eternally as a god, god mode enabled, cheat code, of a world that they now become basically the demiurge of. First of all, you're not going to do that. You're, you're, who you are, what you are, the feeling aspect of self is not ones and zeros that can be put into code. And then even if you could simulate a version of you in that world, it's not you. And this game tells you that you get the option to ascend to the digital world, but your character also questions like, will it actually be me that's in there? Or is the me that I am right now going to disappear and go into the, the void of nothingness that is after death in this atheistic paradigm? while what lives on in the simulation is a simulacra of me. The game tells you right there that it's not gonna be you in there, even if they, or if they like create a program where you can talk to your dead grandma based on the Facebook messages she sent you for five years and it recreates her and imitates her voice from video oh, stuff. Creepy. Oh, this stuff is gonna be part of our future. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. AI versions of our lost loved ones and relatives. This is part of the <laughs> mysteria getting externalized more and more. Mm -hmm. So, intense. yeah, it's, it's intense stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, we can take a little breather from slides for a minute. Sure. <laughs> I think I need one for a second. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that's a lot. There you go. Wow. So big and profound. And I kind of know it's in there, but I haven't had the uh, bandwidth to be able to go through this. I'm incredibly grateful that you have. You've, you've got that uh, intrepid researcher inside you and uh, you know you want to look at the details and look up all the words in the 1828 dictionary and it's there's a lot of integrity to the work that you do I, I highly recommend to go over and subscribe at Rockfin for 10 bucks a month you get access not just to chances behind the scenes stuff but everybody's behind the scenes stuff and as soon as I set a date shortly to get my content up there as well it'll it'll be included so you know, don't hesitate. Totally uncensored. Really cool guy that runs it. I, I got on a call with him. What's his name again? <laughs> Need to contact Jamie? him. Jamie? Jamie, thank you. Yeah, they Excellent. were nice to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, they're, they're awesome real people. And that's what you want out there because you're dealing with a lot of not real people when you're when you're in the mainstream, especially. And are highly yeah. censored realities. Yeah. This has been great. I've really like... I've wanted to get this out to a larger audience for a long time. So it's very, I'm very grateful that I can do it here because you do have a larger audience and uh, they're, it's exactly the people that can do something with understanding this. So, mm -hmm. and yes, flat accord uh, Rockfin is a one subscription for every premium content that's on there. Like Netflix and, uh, only better. <laughs> yeah. Cancel Netflix. And get a Rockfin Yeah, account. exactly. It's pretty cool. Exactly. And who you, whose link you sign up through determines who gets that first like $10 and then who you watch after that, your subscription fee is sort of split out amongst them. And there's other ways that they try to make it more helpful to the creators than Patreon. So it seems like a good deal. I'm still new to it, but I do hope people check that out. ROKFIN.com slash Interverse. Yeah, but, not, um, not no C in there, just so you know. Uh, yeah, so let's, it's kind of let's tricky. give them a link and uh, if they want to sign up right now, you'll get that. So. Let's ask the people too. Do you guys want to see me go through about ten more slides and actually wrap this up, or because I can do it pretty quick? Or do you? Are you guys like tapped out on this uh, game stuff? <laughs> Is that like one know, more think, game uh, that I want to look at? Yeah, yeah. Um, let's. It, do you think about fifteen minutes would do it? 
if we're not at the end of the slides by then, I'll just skip us to the end because it's just, mm -hmm. you know, all evidence that's what we're already, we've already seen the evidence, but. Oh, I must have done something wrong here. It's rockfin.com, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, rockfin.com. Yeah. yeah, okay, I'll do that again. Okay, yeah, they said, please keep going. Okay, we'll, yeah. Here we we'll go. finish this Oops. presentation as it is. Okay, so this yeah, is the numbers uh, World are of great, Warcraft. you guys. Yeah, they're hanging in like crazy, so I love it. <laughs> cool. Mm -hmm. I think it's good to get all this in one video, even if it takes people later a couple of times to watch it. But this is potentially the most addicting game ever created. Psychologists are employed by this company to make sure that the dopamine reward pathways are as hooky as possible. Here's a bunch of people dressing up as their characters from the game. Again, nothing wrong with that. Actually, a pretty cool use of real world creativity in the context of the game, but also points out how identified people can become with the game. Not not wrong to do this. I hope people get that I'm not like judging them. I go I've gone to comic cons before. I have friends that are that would do dress. I would wear a costume like this. It'd be fun. I mean there's nothing right. wrong with it, but right. th there's a heavy identification with it. So mm -hmm. jumping forward, um World of Warcraft is a massively multiplayer online game where people can even form guilds together to complete challenges that require sometimes as many as 40 people playing together, which means it's very difficult to coordinate that. And the uh, sessions usually last many, many hours because it it's if it's a lot. There's like a never ending content stream from the developer where every month or every couple of months they're putting in new end game content, they call it. So here's a, a guild that actually eventually called it quits. They were one of the top guilds in the of all the servers of the game. And the problem was that not that the game was the problem, but the raiding community was so difficult to keep up with. Uh, they kept outdoing each other, spending more and more time online, pushing harder and harder to be the first and the fastest. And they were, uh, when he says we've been slowly killing ourselves off since day one, he doesn't mean they're killing their bodies. He's not even thinking about his body. He's saying we were killing off our guild by being so competitive and pushing the envelope that we couldn't eventually compete anymore. Because guess what? Their bodies couldn't compete anymore. You can't sit in the chair that long. You can't. People died playing this game in internet cafes across the world. I'm serious. Children died in their cribs unattended from parents being addicted to this game. There's an entire economy in Asia of people playing the game to make in-game money and sell it back to players in the United States for cash, for fiat, whatever. It's all fake. Mm -hmm. But here's a picture, too, of people having a wedding ceremony in game, like they're pretending to get married. Their characters are getting married. They probably live many states away from each other and mm -hmm. have never met in real life. But mm -hmm. another aspect of this game, we're going to fly through this digital materialism, the freedom to look like whoever you wish you were a mask over a mask over a mask over a mask. <sighs> A big part of modern gaming is aesthetic based microtransactions where you pay them extra money on top of what you already paid to play the game. And with World of Warcraft, you buy the game and you pay them monthly to keep playing the game online. And you sometimes pay them for aesthetic items like this guy made his character look like Thor from the movie Thor. And all kinds of uh, games are doing this now where just to have the, the exclusive look and the surface, you know, of being a better player, you would shell out your parents' money probably because your kid, I don't think many adults or adults maybe do go for these, I guess, because they have disposable income and they're just like, oh, it's only $2 and I can look like Thor. Mm -hmm. So anyway, this is part of the, uh, the promise of the digital future is that you can be whoever you want. Again, we know that that is uh, <laughs> how we see our digital identity versus the nature of our, <laughs> the reality of our digital identity. Yeah. It's, Slide, slide tells it all. Well done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. We all know what the straw man is. A digital identity in the video game world identity. It's the same thing as a straw man. It's an artificial self. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a slide where an, a, someone, uh, an addict to World of Warcraft, tells his story. We'll put a link to these slides somewhere that you guys can download them and read these. I will, and, I'll upload them to the, all the notes at my blog and, and under the video here as well. Yeah, I'll send you the updated one that has a couple more in it. Okay. But essentially, this guy just tells a story about uh, how he was always fighting with his wife and struggling at his job because all he cared about was playing World of Warcraft. I'm going to admit that when I was a freshman in college I, and sophomore too, I played so much of this game that I had a 1.0 by the end of my freshman year and had gained 100 pounds in, in less than two years. Imagine me plus 100 pounds on this frame. 
World of Warcraft, I'm not saying did that to me. I'm saying I used World of Warcraft to do that to myself. And uh, I was like a guild leader. Like I have a deep experience with this game. I know what it's like on the inside and what people are like inside there. And there's an entire other story of people using the networks of these online games to communicate for tra trafficking purposes because it's not monitored communications. And they still talk in their code and all that. But it's in the context of they're just playing a video game together. This is really happening too. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there's so much to it. But to quote him, he says, playing World of Warcraft made me feel godlike. I have ultimate control and can do what I want with few real repercussions. The real world makes me feel impotent. A computer malfunction, a sobbing child, a suddenly dead cell phone battery. The littlest hitch in daily life feels profoundly disempowering. So this is the one dimensional man that they want to create where everything's only positive. Everything's sunshine and rainbows. There's no more struggle. Everything's handrails. And you play this gamified life, even in society now where everything is just a path laid out for you. And here's the skill module. And this is what you're going to do today and fill out the worksheet and the TPS report. And don't think for yourself, just continue on the path that we've given you to tread and, uh, Man, it just tells you everything right there. And what's ironic is he says, I have ultimate control and can do what I want with few real repercussions. That mm -hmm. is not even true. In World of Warcraft, you can only do what the game is programmed to be able to do and the content that is put in the game. There's plenty of restrictions there, mate. You're not a god there. You just kill a lot of digital creatures and other players over and over again and, and um, do the same thing over and over again. I mean, where's the control there? But yep. This is the psychology of hardcore gaming in some instances. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hey, I just wanted to address something uh, that Eric brought to my attention about Google Mods. And if anybody knows the quick way to turn that uh, nasty AI off, please let me know. Otherwise, I'm looking for it, but I don't see it. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know about that either. I haven't heard of that, but... <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I've never seen that before. So what archetype is this? shadow king i don't know well certainly certainly shadow masculine that 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 hollow masculine um, you can see it in his eyes the poor guy man oh again again it's it's like making me feel ill which i'm not blaming you for i'm just oh, lost it yeah yeah i no, jumped forward yeah. so we don't have to look <laughs> <laughs> oh no that's okay that's okay yeah no i was just going to work uh, analyzing that. So if you, can you go back one more time once you ask that oh, yeah. question? Oh, yeah. I have to answer. The guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, there's there's definitely a, a, a geek archetype, right? That one that one didn't exist. It's it surely does now. It's not necessarily uh, the way I I see it. All the archetypes have full potential for awakening. Full potential for for uh, eat, you know, like eating eating yourself, cannibalizing yourself, ultimately. Um, give me some time. I'll, so he's I'll, an English professor that. too at a university. So oh, I mean, interesting. Yeah, it's already in an artificial world right there. Yeah, 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 yeah. The 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 whole fantasy reality again. Child, right? Like not wanting to be in in the real world. The to, the imaginative construct much much safer and more pleasant. In the uh, etymology here too. Craft is actually a word that means deception and mm -hmm. beguilement. They mm -hmm. call the masons the fellows of the craft. Craftiness, you hear exactly. about the, a crafty thief. So the yep. war craft, they're telling you it, probably who crafted this war for you. But that's mm -hmm. a, you know, we'll, we won't go further on this. We, we're almost to the end. Okay. Uh, right. Another interesting thing about this game is they once, they eventually released um, a classic version two years ago, which mm -hmm. is, they took the game as it was in 2005 before they made all the quality improvements and made it less boring and less time sinky because they did try to make it more streamlined and smooth and you know those reward pathways quicker and the dopamine hits faster but they put out the original game as a separate game uh 15 years later or whatever it was i said nostalgia for a simpler grind they doubled their game subscriber count by doing this. Millions more players resubscribed to the game to go back to that magical year 2005 and play a not very finished game from back then that is full of bugs and frustrations. Although I think they ironed out the original bugs and it's kind of just like an improved version of the original game. But the point remains that of all the potential worlds they could inhabit in an escapism way, they went back to one that was comfortable from their childhood. 
uh, the first probably artificial womb many of them ever lived within. And so like it blows my mind that when there's modern games that are at least like better looking or at least novel because you haven't seen them before, mm-hmm. you go back to a game that likely you spent already many days or months of your life. And I mean that literally as in like if you added up all the hours, it would be months of your life, not like you played it for months. Like this is how I would shudder to see how many days of consecutive logged in time my old World of Warcraft character had. But it would be, mm-hmm. I bet it'd be over 100 consecutive days logged in of uh, my time. And some of that might have been like me away from the keyboard. But mm-hmm. just to touch on a little, there's a lot of symbolism in World of Warcraft that's Gnostic, but I just wanted to do a quickie here. The map in the game's like artwork book shows the the realms. And then on the left here is the uh, Gnostic cosmos or one version of it. Mm-hmm. I'm just pointing out that like the they're seeding things into the game storyline. It's not just like they're doing that on purpose. It's like media all across the, the board, gaming and television shows. It's all you may have noticed, but since I was young, a young kid, the level of supernaturalism that is acceptable and like ideas that are entertained by fiction has gone way off the charts in terms of like other dimensions and spirits and demons and all kinds of, like that stuff has always existed in fiction. Cause guess what? That's what it is. <laughs> the mm-hmm. stuff is fiction. But I, I guess my point with this is just that it's gotten more uh, specific and direct in terms of what types of mysteria is inserted in the games. And an example of that is the Assassin's Creed game, which is a big enough series. I'm not going to talk much about this, but big enough series to do a whole presentation on your own mm-hmm. with it because as i said it's simulation theory symphony it's inception of simulation theories you're in a simulation experiencing your ancestors memories but then the real you is actually within a bigger simulation that you didn't know was a simulation and the gods are all computer programs and all this stuff it's like oh, oh lord and that game is basically designed to be as big and never ending and uh time sinking and addictive is something like world of warcraft but you're playing it alone not with other people mm-hmm. but they and make it they design it in a similar way where it's mm-hmm. just humongous so um, and sorry to be a broken record but that's the weaponization of the child to to leave you feeling confused and lost right like you can you cannot even barely conceive of what you just said <laughs> <laughs> and the only the only answer is to check out yeah and i mean a lot of gaming is just sort of a hypnotic trance i think it's not doesn't have to be that way like mm-hmm. but oh no i know much if we had enlightened games they were actually helping people or you know or if people just got these dynamics and then they were careful about it the way that you would be careful about having a beer maybe you won't have a beer after you know more but right right or maybe you won't play a certain game but another one's okay like this is also art like uh, what's important about assassin's creed though is that they put a lot of history into it. So let me just, they do a lot of like, it's historical fiction basically. Mm -hmm. Like going back in time and the genetic memories of an ancestor. But there's a weird thing that happened in 2017 where the game Assassin's Creed Origins, which was set in ancient Egypt, they had a a room inside the Great Pyramid that you could discover uh, above the Grand Gallery. And they put that in the game. But then a few months later, that was actually found in real life with some sort of like radar technology. So Mm -hmm. Dot Matrix says it's a truthers game. Well, is it though? Because the thing that it's telling you the truth about is that you live in a simulation and that these Gnostic gods are like the only thing between you and oblivion. I think what what Dot Matrix is saying there is um, to create a truthers game, that that would be nice if there was something for us. sorry. Mm -hmm. With like real history and for sure. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But that that game is a huge can of worms. that series, a lot of interesting stuff there, but we will move on. We're almost done. This is actually pretty close to two hours. Like I was hoping for, Mm. we're coming back to Jean Baudrillard again, quoting from this book, kind of full circle here Mm -hmm. to dissimulate is to pretend not to have what one has to simulate is to feign to have what one doesn't have. Simulation is hypocrisy. Remember that. So the gamers paradox is dissimulating personal responsibility, pretending you don't have it while simulating godhood, which you don't have. Whoa. That's my and oh. that's my take on it anyway. Oh my gosh, that's deep. <laughs> uh, and then I hate South Park now, but I did have a screenshot in here from before I decided I hated South Park as we talked about on the phone the other night. <laughs> yes. Disgusting. But uh, yeah. 
they did an episode about World of Warcraft, so that's why this is appropriate. And there's a joke in the game because they're trying to defeat this guy in the game. And they say, mm-hmm. how do we kill that which has no life? Mm-hmm. And I think that applies to, uh, you know, this this Gnostic control system. How do we kill it? It's not alive. It's all it's only conceptual. So we have to recognize the web of conceptuality that we're trapped in and the mysteria that we unwittingly have been programmed to believe in. Mm-hmm. But that's the end of the slideshow, guys. We got all the way to the end of it. Wow. Amazing. So good. Yeah. Wow. You're such a professional. <laughs> you really are. And and that's what makes your, your work, um, not to say that other work is not worth it, but the, you know, the, the value is really there. And I totally encourage everyone. I don't know if this is the link that you'd like to send people to or your Patreon works better, but. Uh, go there or go to my um, website directly where there'll be links to everything. Interverse.com. Yeah. Interversepodcast.com. Pardon me. <clears throat> but Rockfin has got free videos on it too. I, I've been putting, it doesn't have like the large archive of work, but since I joined there, I've been putting the free up, hour up and the full two hour ver- version. So mm-hmm. you will see all my recent content there. Even if you don't pay, you'll see the, uh, the first hours and how it works. It's just one hour for free, second hour for subs, kind of like we did last week. And it went really great. And, mm-hmm. uh, I encourage people to check out Beth and I on, I mean, if you follow Beth, you probably already know about this, but we did that great episode of my show on archetypes and law and how much of this is really connected to that, you know? Exactly. I know it's all threading together, mm -hmm. which is so beautiful because again, it's not leaving us lost and confused and like this is like, no, yeah, it's connecting the dots like crazy. So brilliant. Self-hate, body dysphoria and uh, the mysteria generated by our own internal cacophony of dissonant thought. If I had to put it in a nutshell. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think you just contained it. So that's awesome. Definitely head over to- Thanks for your compliments too. I want to say that a lot of like the recent work where I'm making PowerPoints is really inspired by me working with Michael Thesaria and seeing his process. And I mean, that guy is the professional, consummate professional, Mm -hmm. really amazing Mm -hmm. to to witness his work from uh, an insider perspective. So I'm, I'm inspired by people that I learned from, and I'm just trying to emulate what I thought worked well when it came to me learning things from others that had something good to offer. And I hope that people don't take my take on any of this as a dogmatic look, this someone could have a completely different relationship with the idea of Gnosticism or reality itself. And your personal philosophy is your own gift to yourself. Just remember that. And if you're taking it from somebody else, then mm-hmm. you're uh, you're taking it from yourself too, in a sense, as in you're not giving yourself the gift that was meant for you. Mm-hmm. And you may have a similar conception of the world as other people once you do give yourself your own view, but it still came from you. Kind of like, it's a tricky thing, but people might disagree even, but I don't think that there's like a universal moral natural law. I think that there's a conscience that we each have that tells us how something feels, if it's good or bad or right or wrong for us or for others. And unless that mechanism is broken, it actually kind of feel, it actually ends up being the same across humanity in the sense that it is somewhat universal. But whenever you create a top down law and say, this is the universal law, well, Catholic means universal. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you're not doing good for good's sake or right for right's sake because you felt that it was right. You're doing mm-hmm. it because someone told you what was right and what was wrong, and that's a slippery slope. It can sometimes work out, and sometimes it doesn't work out so well. It all depends on the person who's giving you the, t- the dogma of what is right and wrong and uh, how aligned that actually is with the, the reality of conscience. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, interesting, the gog mod. <laughs> I like that font, <laughs> gog mods. Very good and very in keeping with the theme. So unfortunately, I do have to run. There's something else going to be starting soon. We have our law meetings tonight. Yeah, and we better wrap it up. This was yeah, perfect. yeah. But do do visit interversepodcast.com. All roads lead to that great place. I won't say Rome. And, uh, <laughs> it, you know, so it's important to connect at the websites because you don't know. Every every platform that's not in your hands could... could uh, disappear potentially we're not certainly not wishing for oh, that oh man but, my website uh, is in squarespace's hands right now so i'm plenty nervous about that oh, but oh yeah yeah it's on my agenda is to fix that problem 
Mm -hmm. Simplero is good. I'm a, I'm a strong proponent and affiliate of, of Simplero integrates your, your website, everything. We can talk about that another time, but yeah, uh, well, another time I'd love to hear about that. It's yeah. super good. Yeah. Super good. I'm really in love with them and I, I'm in their hands too. It's the same way, you know, it's at the end of the day, this is never technology. I'll be able to have my own platform for, and, uh, we just have to trust, trust the gooders out there and, and they are, they are certainly gooders. So I'm glad to see much. all these same names in the chat all the way through too. Thanks for hanging in with us, guys. Yeah, uh, yeah. share this with people that like that are interested in games or interested in spirituality. Your parents connects a lot of dots. I mean, to me, this was like the aha once I started to see this web. So mm -hmm, not to keep mm -hmm. keep talking. I'm just having so much fun. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my pleasure. No, this is this is uh, more fun than I've ever had in my whole entire life. Be yourself, have fun, bud. Bud D Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't be couldn't be more wise yeah you're getting lots of good props here people have thoroughly enjoyed this uh just before i forget my interview on unslaved thanks to chance garden who made the introductions there went live yesterday and oh my gosh people started to roll in my door crazy like i had three people instantly Very sign up for primal power enemy. yeah no no it was it was a, a beautiful uh, it's a beautiful meeting. I'm just starting to have it now. So definitely jump over to Unslaved. I love it when they interview you right? because you've got such high level uh, people not to say, you know, it's so tempting. Oh, yeah, we're just the little peons and they're the high levels and stuff like that. They're just people. It's, a, it's the beauty of having that conversation is that, you know, everybody really is in the same boat. Uh, and yet they know the questions to ask you to bring out these really, really deep points that you that you make. So it's super fun. Real quick, Mark Bloom said that Jason and Crow would enjoy what I had to offer here. Mm -hmm. I sent them this outline, and I think that it was too much. I never heard back from them. Mm -hmm. uh, so people that mm -hmm. want to like let them know or let Rose know you'd like to see this on Crow, I agree that they would have a great take on this, maybe a condensed version or a two-parter, but because none of this requires the slides. That's just fun for me to have the visual aids. But anyway, let them know because I did, maybe they just haven't gotten to it yet, but I didn't hear back, and I'd love to talk to them about it too because i think they would have some good things to say about this uh this and i think their audience would benefit from looking at gnosticism differently <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well i'll absolutely pass this on to rose so uh, cool i'm sure she would love it yeah yeah definitely all right everybody i uh, will be be seeing you real soon no doubt i don't know the exact next time but there's lots in the works and uh I'm really spontaneous. By the way, if you would like to get a notification for every single stream that I do, even if it's just five minutes or 15 minutes in advance, which is how I roll sometimes, then uh, send me a message, beth at bethmartins.com, and I'll, I'll, I'll drop you onto that list that uh, of people who want to get emails because I know uh, people keep telling me that they unsubscribe them to my channel by the way subscribe again <laughs> if you don't mind or if you haven't already subscribed please do so I have a feeling these numbers are are, are nothing what they should be from all of the feedback I'm getting and the and the uh, numbers at my website so that's all fine I don't care we're here and it's uh, it's, a, it's a blessing to be here for them for the moment and uh chance thank you so much i absolutely love being your friend and talking to you and having the benefit of all of this incredible knowledge coming through my channel like this yeah we're like besties now <laughs> exactly exactly it, let's just call it a lot of value added to my life when we became friends so mm. very grateful for you too mm. and your community they've been amazing to me appreciate everybody good people around here and i feel extremely blessed by that this was a blast. I looked forward to it yeah. and the peak experience. And now I'm going to be reflecting on it. It's great. Mm -hmm. Well done. Actually, I'm going to be watching your show with Michael that I haven't caught yet. So looking forward to that as well on Unslaved. Six dollars, people. You can sign up and oh. have a month of it. And if you don't want to keep paying six dollars, just think there's so much stuff you could watch for that month with the six dollars. You would be like, OK, I can afford another six dollars the next month. But that's up to you. Support what you love. Help it exist. Okay. And they're, so, and they're so generous you can download, right? So even if you just do one month and you go and grab yourself a bunch of uh, listening for when the internet goes down, that's what I do sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> stockpile. Man, stockpile. Yeah, 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 exactly. A lot of, 
generous content there. All right, everyone, have a beautiful rest of your day. I will definitely see you soon. You can visit BethMartins.com, by the way, if you'd like to do a, a, a quiz and find out where you are on the path of purpose. My uh, second edition of my book, which I didn't name the second edition, but it is a fully un, a, a debugged version of my book, is available. Primal Power is still uh, an open possibility if you'd like to be part of that. Only one of the classes has has gone so far. I have several people still signing up and some amazing souls in there. The chat is absolute, or not the chat, but the, the group forum that is private, completely blowing up and it's out of control. So my apologies if I'm not seeing your comments right now. And I'm going to try to get that Google bot moderator out of there. So I think that's about it for today. Love you guys. Have a great rest of your day.